Timeless, weightless, boundless. Discovering the most fascinating landscapes on Earth by hot air balloon. Five countries, four continents, 180 days. Up, up and away with Phil and Ali Dunnington, an Anglo-German couple whose goal is to discover the world by balloon. Breathtaking flights. Dramatic landings. Exotic cultures. Unexpected encounters. Lighter than air, the balloon floats aloft, bringing us closer to man's oldest dream. The dream of flying. Hakuna Matata, or no worries, as the Kenyan saying goes. Africa has its own rules, and they also apply to the balloonists, Phil and Ali Dunnington. Anyone engaging in a Kenyan adventure can expect rich rewards. Almost 40 years ago, Phil visited Kenya for the first time as a young, inexperienced balloon pilot. Now he has returned with his wife, Ali, ready for a new experience. The balloon expedition is due to start in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi home to almost three million people. The metropolis is often enveloped by a thick blanket of smog, hardly surprising with all the traffic. The wild marabous seem to have come to terms with it. But the balloonists can't. They want to get away from Nairobi and out into the open country, into the heart of Africa. The group's route takes them northwest to Lake Elementaita, one of the countless lakes found across the East African rift system. With good weather and good roads, the convoy makes swift progress they only need three 4x4s to transport the balloon and its team. After just two hours, they reach their first destination, the Sunbird Lodge at Lake Elementaita. Wow. Good, Karibu. Thank you, yes, that welcome. looks good. The lodge, owned by Austrian Ottmar Pircher, will be the kickoff point next day as the five-man team heads for their first balloon flight of the tour. The prospects are bright for a day of adventure. But before the fun can start, there's a safety check to pass. Even adventures must be officially authorized. The aviation authorities have sent two officials to scrutinize everything in detail.
this is where the, all the weight and the stress is taken. Through the carabiner, through this carabiner, down into those wires, and round the bottom of the basket as we saw on the wires. Hakuna Matata, no worries for Phil. After all, he's an expert where it comes to safety issues. Between the nylon tape and, and, the, and, the, and the ferrule, the, the swage ferrule here. Every little detail is examined minutely. The most important component of the envelope is a so-called parachute, or lid of the balloon. So this locks that to there to prevent but not operation. Not really. This can be opened by pulling a rope, letting the hot air escape and enabling the balloon to deflate and descend. Any fault in the attachment or alignment of the cable could be potentially life-threatening. Every action involved in setting up the balloon is observed until after an hour, the balloon is finally upright. The balloon's airworthiness will be personally checked by an inspector. Please don't pull on any of these ropes, yeah? This one especially releases hot air from above and also the white rope, which is here, yeah? These are my, if you want to come into landing, so please don't touch any of that. Remember one thing, <laughs> every landing when the passengers can walk away by, their, by themselves is a good landing. <laughs> <laughs> hot air balloons are among the safest of aircraft. That is, assuming the technical side is all working, and the pilot is well trained. The effort is well rewarded. The unparalleled experience of drifting with the wind, seeing the world from a whole new perspective. Lake Elementaita lies in the center of the East African Rift Valley, an area of the Earth's crust that is particularly active. This accounts for the many volcanoes and lakes with high mineral content. Fantastic. The lakes are famous for their profuse bird life. As water here generally evaporates, Rather than flowing away, the sodium level of shallow bodies of water, such as Lake Elementaita, is high. It's an ideal habitat for small crustaceans and algae, the main diet of flamingos. It takes a delicate hand to pilot a balloon. Wanna give it a try? You can try a blast. Wanna try? Just a little, yeah. Okay. Inspector Keystone Willis Aketch is given a try. A quick open and shut it again. Ollie, from Phil, do you read? Ah. The western side of the lake, or southwestern side. And you will feel the, the reaction of uh, the approximately balloon. 10 knots Always at the moment. Comes a few and seconds we're later. planning to cross the so forest area when you and land burn, beyond. The reaction to go up, it's not immediately, it's not like in a car you press down and you know, the posture yeah, runs off. So the balloon always a little bit slow, <coughs> it takes a few seconds and there it comes. Inspector Aketch proves to have a natural talent. With a slight wind and ideal weather conditions, he navigates the balloon quite smoothly across the lake. Most of the shores of Lake Elementaita are nature conservation areas. The wide canopies of the umbrella acacia trees are typical of the area and offer shady sanctuary for animals against the heat of the sun. All too soon, the flight is over. Obviously, you want to land somewhere near the road, so that, that would be suddenly a good there to land it up. <laughs> Phil searches for a landing site that his recovery team can reach easily by car.
A perfect flight deserves a perfect landing, right in the middle of the track. Good landing. Thank you, and thanks for coming with us. It's been great to have your help. Thank you. To have At you least on board. we know the balloon can fly. You do, yes. You can go back and say, well, I'm still alive. Yeah, it's kind of fine. <laughs> well, I think it's time we had a British gin and tonic. Right. And our folks. Thank you, my dear. So. The permit is granted, and the skies above Kenya are open for our adventurous balloonists. Good to be here with you. Good to be here. Yeah. Good to have you here with us. Thank you. Well. Yeah. Next morning, Phil and Ali drive about 50 kilometers to the north. Their aim is the Menengai caldera, one of the largest volcanic craters on Earth. If the flight today succeeds, Phil and Ali will be the first to cross the crater in a hot air balloon. It's windy. The trees offer enough protection to get the balloon inflated but as soon as the balloon is upright, gusts begin to tug at the envelope. There's no time for lengthy farewells. Ali releases the safety line, and the balloon takes off in a rush. Now, the wind needs to blow in the right direction. And she's done it. The balloon reaches the edge of the crater. The bottom of the caldera is 500 meters below. For safety's sake, Phil and Ali stay quite high up at first. Yeah, so far so good. The crater is 12 kilometers in diameter. Right in the middle, the balloonists chance a descent. It's quite a risky maneuver, as wind conditions can be treacherous inside the caldera itself. Look how all these trees are growing out of the lava. Wow, it's just amazing, huh? A few hundred years ago, this was all molten, glowing lava. The volcano is dormant now. And bushes and trees have conquered the cold, hardened rock. They, in turn, offered sanctuary to animals, and gradually, a unique habitat evolved. There is a single road cutting through the crater. It leads to the construction site of a geothermic power station, which is planned to supply the area with energy in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. The smoke or yeah. fire or something. Yeah. That's not volcanic steam, is it? Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's only a campfire. Perhaps poachers or illegal wood gatherers. Cultivated fields run right up to the edge of the crater. The fertile soil is ideal for maize, grain, and especially coffee. The flight has picked up speed. Phil is expecting a rustic landing. So, folks, remember the landing. I want you to be as well held in as you can. Make sure you're not leaning against anything that's going to bruise your bum. 
stay in the basket till I say it's safe to get out and oh. we need to have everything stowed. Oh, yeah, up see that, that's good. Okay, get ready for landing, it'll be a bit of a bump. Alright. Lights off. Oh, watch. Rough ground contact isn't unusual. Balloon pilots with a sense of adventure have to be pretty tough. No, I was okay. Are you okay? I'm okay. I'm very much okay. Well, you call out first. The spectacle hasn't gone unnoticed. The locals flock towards them from their schools and fields. There are some 2,000 coffee plantations in Kenya. The beans ripen at varying speeds, but they can only be harvested when they turn red. As machines can't tell the difference in color, harvesting is still done by hand. It takes months to harvest the endlessly long rows of coffee bushes. Kenya produces nearly two million sacks of Arabica coffee every year. They are taken to the big coffee auctions in nearby towns and land up almost everywhere around the world. The balloon convoy moves on. After eight hours on the road, they reach their next destination. The Maasai Mara, a natural paradise bigger than almost any other on Earth. At times, the reserve is almost like an open-air zoo. It's not advisable to leave your vehicle. These are wild animals and they live here. Humans are only tolerated. They have no automatic rights. The animals have long ago got used to the clicking of paparazzi cameras from inside odd metal boxes. As long as a respectful distance is maintained, they graciously permit the inquisitive spectators to take part in their lives. Tourists who balk at the prospect of the long, arduous drive to the game reserve can also fly in by light aircraft. Phil is waiting for an old friend of his at one of the airfields. Wildlife filmmaker, cameraman and balloon pilot Alan Root, who has been living in Kenya for decades. Alan, Alan! How are you? Oh, great to see you, yeah. How are you? You look great! Their last balloon flight together was over 35 years ago. Now, they want to relive the old days again. In the early 70s, Alan Root was the first person to film animals from a hot air balloon, whilst making the documentary Safari by Balloon. And it was Phil he hired to teach him how to fly. Yes, yeah, so. So here's my original logbook from 1972. I was trying to build my hours at the time. Yes, yeah, so you can see. I, can see, I, yeah. I only had 50 hours. So mm. it was the blind leading the blind, really. It was. I probably had more hours in the air than you. Well, I oh, certainly yeah. did in yeah. airplanes. With airplanes, yeah. Mm. So, so I was less nervous than you throughout. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and I think, if I remember, we only flew at about 100 feet the whole way. Most of the time. Because yeah. burning, wasn't it? Memories come to life around the campfire. Yeah, well, the thing you've got to remember about a balloon is that it's got four tons of 
air inside it, four tons of inertia. So it takes some stopping and you've got to anticipate its movements, particularly if you're going down. Yeah. Start rounding out well before you actually get to the point at which you want to round yeah. out. Do you want to have a try? And we'll go down and see if you can round out nicely just above these boats. Okay. <laughs> I think I've left it a bit late, don't you? I reckon you have. <laughs> and even though Phil and Alan got a dunking, it was the start of the hot air ballooning era in Kenya. Phil and Alan's early, somewhat clumsy attempts to explore the wilds of Kenya by balloon laid the foundations of what has become a highly lucrative leisure time activity. The balloon we're flying today is the Mararamo. It does not matter where you go in the basket. Everyone gets a window seat. I want uh, four in part to here and four in part to here. Is that going to be okay? The launch preparations made by the commercial companies are elaborate. Their huge gondolas can carry up to 20 passengers, and the host of helpers needed is correspondingly large. Balloon safaris are the main attraction in the Maasai Mara. Welcome to ballooning in the Mara. The big guys have right of way. Then Phil and Alan get the go-ahead to launch. So well, hmm. we should shake hands at being back in the air for the first time in what, 35 years right, or something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. And thanks to you for introducing me to Africa. Well, at least ballooning in Africa, anyway, it's uh, fantastic. Going up to the Mara River now. Nice flight line, this isn't yes, it? Yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> so, do you want to have a go? On this one, we are. Yeah. We're climbing slightly, you have control. All right, control. If you want a glove, you can pull it out. Pull it out. Yeah. Alan doesn't seem to have forgotten anything. How am I doing, Captain? Well, so far so good, <laughs> but you haven't hit the water yet. No, well, I'm waiting until we get to the river. <laughs> Balloon safari is a good business. Each passenger pays between three and five hundred euro for a one and a half hour flight. But for most tourists, the unique view is worth every cent. Masai Mara Conservation Area borders on Tanzania 
and belongs to the northern part of the Serengeti Game Reserve. This is where Alan Root's career as a cameraman and nature cinematographer began. In 1959, he was working for the Oscar-winning German movie Serengeti Shall Not Die, made by Bernhard and Michael Cimic. Since then, he has made many award-winning documentaries, contributing greatly to nature conservation in the process. The Mara River is the lifeline of the game reserve. It carries water year-round, ensuring the continued survival of the animals, even in times of drought. Ali and the rest of the team follow the balloon back and forth across the terrain. They want to be there as soon as possible after the balloon has landed to retrieve the basket, envelope and pilots quickly. I gave, you know, sort of five or six seconds. Oh, God, yeah. The wind is starting to pick up. A stand-up landing won't be possible today. On the ground, the gusts of wind are pulling at the envelope, dragging the basket along below. Well, we great. extracted you from the wreckage. Thank you very much. Okay. So it was great yeah. to be flying with that you again, Alan. Uh, back in Africa. Fantastic. After the early flight, a well-deserved breakfast awaits, with plenty of spectators. All of a sudden, some more visitors approach. A herd of elephants. They also just wanted to have a snack next to the river. The air is cool and fresh, and there's plenty of juicy greenery growing on the riverbank. The herd is led by a wary matriarch. The big female walks ahead to check out the territory. Elephants don't like to be too close to humans. Generally, a menacing gesture is enough to make it quite clear who really belongs here and who is just visiting. Now, it's farewell to Alan Root and the Maasai Mara, and the balloonists return to Lake Elementaita. Thick clouds hanging over the mountains do not bode well, 
They'll be lucky if the weather cooperates for tomorrow's flight. The next day dawns, and the conditions are less than ideal. But Ali still wants to try setting up. Gusty winds prevent the air from being heated in the balloon. The flames keep being blown around. Ali has to be careful that she doesn't set the envelope on fire. Here on the ground, the balloonists have to fight the wind. Once they've succeeded in taking off, they glide with the wind. Can you sort this, Uli? This stuff away, please. Time, ten past. As always, Ali notes the time so she can enter the duration of the flight later on in the logbook. There's enough gas to stay aloft for two hours. What is windig? Ali launches quickly. Pilot life failure. Pilot life failure. Now we've got a pilot life failure. There's nothing. Where's the striker? There must be a striker somewhere. Right, it's going to be a huge bang. There are power lines everywhere. A collision would be fatal. We have a power flight failure. It's going to be a huge bang. Ali pulls the rip line to get the balloon down as quickly as possible and begins a controlled crash landing. The crew gets away with just the scare and a few minor injuries. Back at the lodge, they try to reconstruct what went wrong. It wasn't the wind. It was a technical failure. Despite all the safety precautions, the pilot light failed. Ballooning accidents are rare, but they can have fatal results. The biggest danger is power lines. It was only thanks to Ali's swift reactions that an even worse disaster was averted. Before the next flight, the burner will be examined thoroughly. He thought that the leak was here. He told me he thought the leak was here. We tightened this yesterday because this is supposed to go down straight. Yeah, that's right. This is supposed to go down straight. It's not this twisted. Otmar Pircher operates balloon safaris here and helps with the repairs. Everything should work perfectly now. Early morning at Lake Elementaita. The diurnal animal shift begins another day of foraging. Pelicans congregate above their prey in small groups and then attack as one, rather a unique method of fishing. Hi guys. 
The burner has been repaired. And with the shock behind them, the balloonists prepare for the next flight. Today they plan to fly the balloon over the adjacent Soisambu Conservancy, which, although not quite as large or famous as the Masai Mara, still has a remarkably wide variety of wildlife. Water buffalo, with their constant companions. The tick birds keep these big beasts free of irritating parasites. Food for the one and relief for the other. A perfect symbiosis. The road leads the recovery crew straight through the bush. Following the balloon becomes an involuntary game safari. Good, yeah, we should make it. And now you just have to hope the wind keeps. I mean, that, oh, yeah, that was so terrible. Trouble with lakes is that I know, and then you to, come yeah. to the middle of the lake, and then suddenly it stops and goes back. Oh! Yeah, you come down to 10%. Back at two knots now. Soisambu is a private nature reserve. It includes about three quarters of the shoreline of Lake Elementaita. But the rest of the nearly 200 square kilometer game reserve consists of dry savanna. The big five may not all be represented here, lion and rhino for instance, but there are also far fewer tourists. Just outside the reserve, Phil discovers a small airfield. There's one of his aeroplanes sitting out on the strip, looking his ears to the right of it in the parking. The landing strip seems to be waiting especially for the balloonists, a perfect opportunity for the passionate pilot, Phil. Another hard landing. <laughs> we did it! We did right it! Right on wow. the centre line of the airstrip. <laughs> Not very elegant, but we did it. Yes, and what's this one? That looks great. This one. That looks amazing. Just get up and worry anyway. Yes, that's right. Of course, Phil is immediately drawn to the planes. The little aircraft are mostly used for agricultural purposes. These carry two people. What stuff do they put in this one? Um, insecticides, fertilizers, things to kill things off, defoliants. And they have a GPS system where that tells you whether you've sprayed the right row, because what mm -hmm. they do is they fly oh, the line okay. and okay. then they come, turn around sharp and come back and do the same again and round like this. And before they used to have to do it using a flag man, where a <coughs> man stood with a flag and they flew up to the flag and turned around and then came back on the other side of the flag and then he moved and so on and so on in mm -hmm. 10 metre widths. Yeah. Now they do all that on GPS. So all he does is he follows the line, and not only does it tell him when to turn and how, when he's finished, it says, don't start yet, start now. And they start oh, exactly really? where they left off last wow. time. So it's very clever. Mm. That's amazing. No overspray, no missing of anything. Yeah. And that's modern technology. Yeah. Yeah. 
But, but uh, Ollie was asking, what's happened to the poor flag man? And I said, he's got fired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie, he's sitting up there drinking gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> The Kenya sojourn is drawing to a close, and Phil is on the lookout for a fitting end. In this area here would be particularly good for takeoff. A hundred kilometers north of Lake Elementaita, the area is still virgin territory for balloonists. So Phil is on his way with local farmer George Manuel, who runs a farm up there together with his wife Janet. Yes. And then to the left of that, you can see all the lines of the coffee. You can see the lines Taramoka. of the coffee, and then Peter's at, up at the top of that. Yeah, OK. And we can see the football pitch that we went to look at this morning. Oh, the you football, can see the football pitch. see the okay. football pitch is there. Radio, yeah. And yeah. then there's your place. So that gives us a really good line to come down this way. So the sort of area, if we're going to be taking off from Teramuka, which is here, or from your place, which is there, then we really want something which has south or a bit of east in the wind direction. And there's the equator. Mm. I mean, we're closer even than I thought. Isn't that the equator? It is zero, 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 zero. I don't so think I've ever flown on a map which has zero, 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 zero. Well, you on wouldn't it. have to go an awful lot further north. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Well, that would be the thing, the equator trans-equatorial flight, wouldn't it? I mean, that's Lake Soleil and that's north of the equator. Yeah, yeah. So literally, we're looking at the yeah. equator now, aren't we? We are. About where that cloud shadow is, I would say. Yeah. Right, there's a target for us. Challenge for Have the you next ever few flown days. Over the right. Crossing the equator in a hot air balloon. Will the weather cooperate? It's one of these. It's one of those things, yeah. Yeah, let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. You might get a low. Almost on the equator. About five, ten kilometers south of it. Okay, what we need definitely today to have very close to us is this striker, which gives us a spark and then we can try to relight it in case we have another failure. So, that's what we need today. This time, nothing is being left to chance. If everything goes to plan, they'll reach their goal in around an hour. Burner and pilot light are both working perfectly. Mission Equator Crossing can begin. <laughs> but a stubborn carabiner won't release the balloon. What is the matter with the system? It's this stupid dirt. Okay, where's the camera? All right, we're going to have to come down again. Everybody to the basket, be careful of the car. Okay, okay wait on as yeah, soon as we touch hands down, on the hands basket. on. Don't, don't lift your feet off the ground. The I'm in control here for the it's moment. Okay. You've got to be undone. That's yeah, got to be undone. Not. That's it. Ah. Good. Ah, now you've got my goal. Hakuna Matata. No worries. Sometimes it just takes a little patience. <laughs> So far, so good. Both pilot lights are working. Um, we only have three, four knots, which is lovely. Plan is to fly across the equator this morning, which is about 10 kilometers down that way. In half an hour, we could cross the equator in this speed. Doing nine knots, but 10, 20 kilometers per hour, and it's 10 k to the equator. Yeah, so. Morning from Phil. We're tracking uh, almost due north now, 10 knots. 
so um, keep us visual. Thanks to George and Janet's knowledge of the area, the recovery team can keep up with the balloon. Yeah, Bill, we can see you quite well. Over. There are only a few narrow tracks running through the farmland fields. Yeah, you're all running on the way to school. Yeah, when I fire, the kids are running away. Have a look, so yeah, this is the kind of field yeah. we might enter. We're only two, two minutes south of the equator now. The balloon can be seen from miles around and gets an enthusiastic greeting wherever it goes. Hello. See the old railway line bar? In the previous century, these tracks were an important part of the country's interior transport system. But meanwhile, Virtually all traffic has shifted to the roads. Do we know whether the equator is before these mountains? Uh, well, it goes across like this, but I don't know exactly where. It's not the Which way? Well, it goes, here it, no, it goes left to right, so I don't know where it goes left to right. That's the problem, because we right. don't have a map, so... We've got only 1.81 miles to go to the equator, so we're going to cut on. Yep, that's right, you're so close, you can almost touch it now, I think. One nautical mile, so two kilometres, yeah. Two so, kilometres so to go. So hopefully, if we, by the time wow, we get to that next time... that'd be fantastic, time, yeah. The two have almost reached the magical border. Somewhere below is the line separating the northern and southern hemispheres. I reckon actually this could be the equator, don't you think? It could be, yeah. It could be the equator yeah. road. It's going straight across and we're absolutely nearly there. There's just uh, two more seconds to go, eh? Yeah. Wow, it'd be amazing to do it, huh? I've always wanted to know where the equator's marked on the ground like it is on the map. So, yes, so that's right. Are. It's just a dirt road and nothing else. Maybe the farmstead down there actually straddles the equator. Ali starts the countdown. Seven, six, five. We've done it! Crossed the equator for the first time ever in a balloon. Well done! Congratulations! <laughs> That's amazing! What an achievement! Excellent! Thanks everybody so yeah. much! Yeah! Fantastic! Now I the next time. have to find a good landing site, obviously. Very good. Well, we'll try and make our way across country and follow you. So it will be a very steep descent, but hopefully not a hard one, yeah? There's not much time left to enjoy the achievement. The flight has taken well over an hour, longer than they'd planned, and their gas is running low. Yeah, we're going to land in the next couple of minutes here. The whole school will be about.
Thank you, crew. Hello, Hello. super, Janet. Yeah. Well done. Well, well done. done. A world first. A world first. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Well, we think so, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Good yeah. enough. Yeah. Must be. Must be. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, you guys. Yeah, great. <laughs> Hello, How nice to meet you. I'm very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. 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 Be careful. Mission accomplished. The successful conclusion to an eventful balloon expedition with many highlights and one crash landing. Hakuna Matata, no worries. That's Africa for you. Mongolia. For the first time, Phil and Ali Dunnington are heading for the skies above this fascinating country. As a professional tour guide, Ali knows Mongolia, but this expedition will be a first for her and her husband, Phil. Together with their crew and three other international ballooning teams, they are setting out on a journey of exploration through this enormous Central Asian country. Their aim is to conquer the skies where no hot air balloon has gone before. For three weeks, the four intrepid balloon teams will traverse the wide open spaces of Mongolia. More than 3,000 kilometers lie before them. A vast Gobi Desert, bleak rocky landscapes, and grassy steppes. It is said that there are more horses in Mongolia than people, and certainly, life for the locals here revolves around horses. 800 years ago, the Mongolian army conquered swathes of Asia and Europe on horseback. Their ruler, Genghis Khan, created the largest realm in history, with Mongolia as the center of his mighty empire. The glorious past has not been forgotten. The bronze Mongolian leader is still enthroned in front of the Houses of Parliament in the capital of Ulaanbaatar. Here, on the Great Square, is where our expedition members meet. They've traveled here from England, Germany, France and Switzerland. It has taken a whole year to prepare, organizing the transportation of four balloons halfway around the world and getting countless permits granted. Ulaanbaatar is a very modern city, even down to the daily traffic jams. Around one million people live here, a third of the total population of Mongolia. But the balloonists aren't really interested in city life. They are itching to get out to the steps. There are eight vehicles in the convoy. It's the end of August. The rainy season is just over and the steps are green. True to tradition, herdsmen here work on horseback. But there are also much more modern forms of horsepower, like cars and motorbikes, parked next to their gears 
the traditional round tent. Mongolia is huge, four times larger than Germany. With only three million inhabitants, the population density is extremely low, and there are vast distances between inhabited places. A two-hour drive west of Ulaanbaatar lies the starting point of their adventure. All the problems encountered in the run-up time are forgotten. Getting local aviation authorities to issue permits, the business of transporting the balloons, getting hold of the gas, and the long trips just to get here. The gentle rolling hills of the Hustai National Park offer Ali and the other pilots ideal conditions for their first exploratory flight. But balloonists don't just want to fly high. They also like to demonstrate their skills closer to the ground. Contour flying is almost an art, keeping the balloon floating just inches away from the ground. The pilots regulate the heat inside the balloon with blasts from the burner, making it rise or sink. But they can't actually steer in the conventional sense. Their direction is determined by the wind alone, and each balloon drifts to a different landing site. Ali is expecting a soft landing because of the light wind. The ground crew can follow them easily. They're waiting for her when she touches the ground. One hour, exactly. Fantastic. The Hustai National Park is famous for its rare Shavalsky horses. These wild horses originally roamed the entire Eurasian steppes. During the last century, they almost became extinct, but today they are successfully being released into the wild as part of a breeding program. A loud whistling pierces the air here. This is the groundhog's warning signal of imminent danger. Because enemies, like these eagles, lurk everywhere. The Mongolian gerbil is another favorite target for birds of prey. They have to be constantly vigilant. All their senses are primed for flight. A falcon searching for its prey. And the next predator is circling. This eagle won't be going hungry today. Bayan Gobi, a prairie paradise on the edge of the Gobi Desert. Known as yurts, or gears in Mongolian, these round tents are still the classic shelter for Mongolians, and they travel with them from one pasture to the next. This oasis between scrubby steppe and desert 
offers everything the herdsmen need, water and juicy grass. Bayangobi is today's destination for the balloonists. At the end of a four-hour journey in their minibuses, they are greeted by the sight of their accommodation. No comfortable hotel, but traditional Mongolian girls. These felt-covered tents normally house an entire family. For tourists, these are double rooms. That's our gear. You're in number 29. Be careful what you had. Just step in. Let's go around and have a look. So, that's how it looks in a traditional Mongolian gear. Mm -hmm. Gear is the traditional Mongolian word for something like the home, yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. And it can be assembled within an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And there's a special rule where women and men sleep. Mm -hmm. So, the women are always on the right side and the men are on the left side, yeah? Then you have a wonderful stove where we make fire in the evenings if it's cold. And if you have a special guest coming in, he will get the honorable seat right mm -hmm. in the middle here, mm -hmm. uh, near the fire to keep yeah. warm. So I hope you have a good time here, yep. settle in, and I'll see you around and look after the other clients. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Okay. okay, I will stay on the right side. That's mine. Meanwhile, a storm has gathered outside. Ballooning is definitely out for today. Luckily, the center of the storm passes across the distant dunes. Heavy hail showers are common here, often turning the dunes white. The weather forecast for the following day looks promising. Only a few clouds and a light wind. Before takeoff, Phil Dunnington, the expedition leader, gives everyone a briefing. We'll need to set up um, a timing schedule and a series of options for the takeoff location tonight. Um, it's looking reasonably good at the moment. There are a couple of build-ups over there, but I think they're far enough away at the moment not to worry about. So we want to be in the air by no later than 6.30. So if we look at, say, 9 o'clock for dinner, that gives us just enough time to have a gin and tonic if we do fly, and lots of time to have lots of gin and tonics if we don't. A large level area near their overnight accommodation is chosen as the takeoff location. That's it, good. First, the baskets must be equipped with burners and gas cylinders. Then, the balloon envelopes are laid out pointing downwind. Using a fan, the balloon is first blown up with cold air. As soon as it is full, Phil starts heating the air with a burner. Only then does the balloon become light enough to take off. It is still tethered to one of the vehicles to stop it from flying off on its own while Phil is making other preparations. I'm sure he can handle the horse if it does get <laughs> The balloon towers more than 20 meters above them. When the temperature inside the balloon reaches over 90 degrees centigrade, it develops enough lift to carry three passengers through the air. Phil takes off first. His balloon will be accompanied some of the way by riders, so Phil initially stays close to the ground. He has never had an escort like this before. Horses are generally terrified of the hissing balloon monsters in the sky. 
Here's the skeleton. Oh. During takeoff, Phil has to keep an eye simultaneously on height, wind and terrain. No easy job. Down here, look. I think I'm going to be landing very shortly because otherwise we'll be right in the middle of all these uh, sand dunes and the area ahead looked very wet, so uh, I'm going to be descending for a, a landing in probably the next five or ten minutes. Are you talking to the other balloon? Peter, Phil, I've got 50 degrees of right up here. Oh, hopeless. What happened? Well, Peter said if you climb, you'll get more left, and I've gone up and I've got 50 degrees of right. Phil's balloon is drifting in a different okay, direction well, to the one he had planned. Like this here. time it's not really a problem, because the wind is making his balloon drift quite slowly, and the ground teams can still follow him easily. Not normally I'm scared, I'm scared of heights, you know. I'm scared of um, looking down from our balcony at home. But here, I'm so much higher, and I just don't have any fear, and it's just amazing. It's just a different world, completely. Oh, wow. Goyo Radna Bazaar is the group's interpreter. This is her first balloon flight. We're uh, descending now for final landing on the track, uh, which is about 500 metres down that track left off the main route. Yeah. To prevent the balloons from being driven towards the inaccessible dunes, or even the swamps behind them, the pilots decide to land. It was just a short flight, and the horseback riders had no problem keeping up over the five-kilometer stretch. Phil manages a perfect landing. One of the best that I've ever done in terms of visibility and the interest uh, of the ground below and the people and everything, so really superb and uh, a great beginning to our huge adventure here in... in um, uh, Mongolia. The convoy of balloonists, with all their kit and caboodle, sets off towards the northeast. They're heading for the Tsenkha Valley and the Kangai Mountains. There aren't many paved roads around here. Our travelers have to ford rivers, avoid muddy trails, and negotiate bumpy stretches. Not all of them make good progress. They take a break. The truck with the gas bottles is missing. It seems as if the um, gas truck went to the wrong camp and uh, it's trying to cut across country to get to the correct camp and in doing so got stuck in the river. So now we're looking to see if we can find where it is because it needs two vehicles to tow it out. We're just having a look to see if we can identify where on the route it is stuck in the mud. So if you think it's a truck, that's that four to one. So I think that's our better. But that's for the right of the left. You need to move at last, the search is successful. <laughs> There's not much they can do without help. But with the driver's experience and the combined efforts of the others, the problem is quickly solved. However, the group only reaches the camp right at the end of the Tsenkha Valley after sunset.
next day, the balloonists are up at dawn. They have to get everything set up quickly. The pilots are hoping for a drainage wind to carry them along the valley. This is only possible early in the morning when the cool air from the mountains blows down the slopes. Later during the day, the winds become too thermic and unpredictable. Tour guide Togi Erdene will join them in the basket today. He is apparently not very happy about the idea, though his colleagues envy him. Togi, Togi play. Maybe next time never play. <laughs> Today, Togi will be initiated into the circle of balloonists, together with his colleague, Oyuna. Don't put your arms out there. Don't put your arms outside. <laughs> Maybe there is more than one landing. Maybe we bounce. Yes, yes. You stay in time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's it. Enjoy the flight. Once pilot Richard Gieselink has explained the safety regulations to them, they're ready to go. All the balloons are ready before sunrise. Richard takes off first. Next, it's Ali's turn. Then the Swiss pilot, Adrian Held. They're all aloft in time to greet the rising sun. As planned, the wind blows the balloons quickly down the valley. The ground team in the 4x4 minibus tries to keep them in sight, because once the balloons have started, there's no going back. Every balloon has a ground crew with its own vehicle. They keep in touch with the pilots by walkie-talkie. The early start was worth it. The wind is ideal, carrying the balloons at just the right speed down the Tsenkher Valley. As long as the balloons are still heading down the valley, the pilots can relax and enjoy the view. But it doesn't stay as straightforward as that. The Swiss balloon starts to drift slowly over side valleys. Their ground crew has a tough time following them. Once visual contact has been lost, it's nearly impossible to reach the balloon by radio too. The ground crew has to find a hill that's accessible with their 4x4. Then they have to wait for a response from the balloon's pilot. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ali's following team has reached the designated landing site. It wasn't easy to find a good place in the somewhat confusing terrain, but Ali manages a precision landing here too. Wow, that was fantastic. Yay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Amazing. lovely. She enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> Adrian is still in the air. His ground crew can't find him in the maze of tributary valleys. Adrian is getting a little anxious. He wants to land, but the terrain here is anything but ideal. The wind starts to pick up, blowing them towards the trees. He has to ascend again. Okay. Yeah. 
Are they uncursed me? While his team is searching for him. Adrian tries to come down again. This time, it has to work. At the same place where Ali landed. Preferably. All of a sudden, the wind gets stronger. Adrian's balloon finds the only tree for miles around. The envelope has to be brought down as quickly as possible, so the balloon can come to a standstill. The new circus girls and I'm going to bend it. Well done. Uh, also, das uh, war so. Wir sind relativ schnell gewesen und das war ein kleines Stück, wo man landen konnte. Ich wollte nicht weiter. Deshalb haben wir den Baum genutzt, um zu bremsen. Das ist ein normales Manöver beim Ballonfahren. A good reason to pop a couple of corks. We come to the very noblesse. As dictated by its aristocratic past and the tradition of ballooning, Togi and Ayuna are elevated to the ballooning aristocracy. Ballonists, the noblesse society of ballonists. You know, the god of the ballonists brought us from Earth up in the high skies, some fire. <laughs> Nice smoke. We have to honor. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you get the baptize you in the name and you called from now on Freiherr von Zante Kabar. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> These pastors the grazing lands for sheep, goats, cattle and horses. The animals govern the nomadic lives of the herdsmen. It's late afternoon. The balloonists have changed their mode of transport. They have been invited to the home of a nomadic family to share their evening meal. That afternoon, a sheep was slaughtered. Now, everyone pitches in to help with the preparation. Traditional Mongolian cuisine revolves around meat. Vegetables are rare. In the kitchen tent, the fire is lit. Mongolians don't grill their meat, they boil it, so that none of the precious fat content is lost. <laughs> If you can just mount a satellite dish outside the living room tent, moving is easy. But only a third of the Mongolian population lives a nomadic life. Goyo, the interpreter, explains the meaning of airag. Soured mare's milk is part of their basic diet, as is cheese. Sharing is everything in Mongolia. Thank you. You can get up to Every visitor is greeted by the lady of the house offering airag. This family is very lucky to be in a beautiful location, nice. There's a water there, you know, trees, uh, enough grazing, and they don't have huge amount of, huge need of moving. So this family just moves twice a year, um, and they would put, put more felt and more covers and more carpets. Meat for the Mongolians and additional vegetables, especially for their guests. The food is served from a large pot and put on the table. It has been an eventful day. They all enjoy the food, the hospitality, and the company. Oh. 
alone in this area. I think it's just a fantastic achievement again. The journey continues. Their next goal is the Gorky Teralj National Park. Mongolian roads are a punishing challenge for any vehicle. The drivers are used to fixing flat tires. Meanwhile, the balloonists want to start setting up. Ominous clouds start to gather in the sky. The pilots decide against flying, except for Ali. The well-coordinated team manages to get the balloon ready for takeoff within half an hour. Okay. Let's go. Ali didn't want to miss this flight for anything. After all, it is a pioneering flight. Wow, the first time a hot air balloon has ever flown in Gorky Terrell's natural park. Gorky Terrell's lies at 1,600 meters above sea level in the Kenti Mountains. Because of its alpine nature, the area is often called the Switzerland of Mongolia. The hilly grasslands are highly prized pastures for the nomads. In summer, the place is swarming with itinerant farms, not to mention numerous tourist camps. The National Park is especially famous for its unusual rock formations. A nomad's wealth is his animals, whether they are livestock or domestic pets. Ali searches for a favorable wind direction at various altitudes. She doesn't want to be driven into the mountains, but equally wants to avoid inaccessible and marshy areas too. Despite the apparent glut of open spaces, it's not at all easy to find a suitable landing site where her crew can also retrieve her. At last, Ali drops anchor. The crew is waiting for her. With their help, the balloon can be towed to a suitable landing site. Yeah, yeah. 
The herdsmen observe the unusual visitors with typically Mongolian calm. After every balloon flight, the gas cylinders are refilled. The gas truck is fully laden. After all, these supplies have to last for the entire trip. Propane gas is pumped from big containers on the truck into the smaller bottles for the balloons. When white vaporized gas escapes from the cylinder, it's full. A full gas cylinder weighs around 30 kilograms. Loading them safely in place in the individual balloon baskets before every flight is a tiring job. And it's not without hazards either. The bottles are highly pressurized. When a pipe bursts, it can be pretty scary. This time, no damage is done. All is well, and they can soon carry on. The journey continues through a natural crane habitat. Swampy lowlands lure the birds here in summer. The balloon teams eventually reach Karkorin, one of the larger provincial towns. A little market provides nomads from near and far with their daily requisites. <laughs> it's for the woman and... Warm clothing and boots are the most important. Followed by tack for their horses, portable stoves, pots and everything else one might need for a life out in the steppes. Outside the little town lies the Buddhist temple compound of Erdene Zoo. It was built from the ruins of the nearby city of Karakorum, the 13th century center of power of the medieval Mongolian Empire. Around 1930, the Stalinist rulers raised the monastery almost to the ground. Only three temples survived the communist era. Now we can see that, that there is a Milwani statue in who is the Buddha Shakyamuni when he was the young. These three remaining temples are not only an important Buddhist center, they are also a great tourist attraction. And there is a left side is on the wall painting is Buddha his living activities and about the his history of the life. The balloonists are about to be given a great privilege. Two of the four balloons are granted permission to launch from within the temple walls. An unusual experience also for the monks. The compound, once again, has more than 70 of them living there. Outside the walls, Phil and Ali prepare for their flight. They want to launch at the same time as the other balloons and float over the temple compound together. Load up. But there's a delay. 
Adrian's balloon is still on the ground and the wind has changed. Now both basket and balloon have to be repositioned so that they are once again pointing downwind, or the balloon envelope will roll uncontrollably from side to side while it is being inflated. With the full gas cylinders in it, the basket is heavy, and the semi-inflated envelope pulls at the ropes. Die Windrichtung hat 90 Grad gedreht. Das ist relativ selten, aber das konnten wir jetzt so einfach handeln, weil wir so viele nette Mönche als Helfer haben, wo wir den ganzen Korb so einfach umplatzieren konnten. Wenn du natürlich nur mit drei, vier Leuten bist, musst du unter Umständen vielleicht die Luft völlig rauslassen und dann neu starten. Das ging jetzt so einfach, weil eben alle mitgeholfen haben. At last, they're ready. The balloons outside the temple walls start first. Adrian can launch now too, thanks to the monk's energetic help. But the balloonists' plan to float directly over the historic temple compound doesn't work out. Because the wind changed, they only managed to drift past one side of it. But even so, the balloonists still get a unique view. The balloonists float over the town of Kakorin and onwards towards the mountains. I pulled the top out of the balloon to let some air out because I want to come down reasonably quickly because I don't want to end up on those mountains and we will do it this way. Phil and Ali use the opportunity to descend and take a closer look at the town. From above, you can see that Mongolians prefer living in gears, even in towns and villages. These versatile round tents are more than just comfortable and airy. They can also be packed up and taken away when the yearning for the steps gets too strong. The pilots have to land just beyond the town. The sun is going down, and no one wants to be still airborne in darkness. The unusual flying objects attract a lot of attention. Soon half the town is on its way to the place where the balloons have landed. The children are especially curious. And after Adrian, allows several of them to climb into the basket. There's no holding them back. Bye bye. The chance to take off in a hot air balloon is something no one wants to miss, and Adrian fulfills their wish. Till late in the evening. Next day, the group heads for the desert. The landscape here is drier and starker. But even in the bleak, stony mountain territory, there is still life to be found. Camels do well here. and all kinds of little animals live in between the rocks. Pikas can make do with very little, 
and are quite happy in this forbidding landscape. The rock fissures give them safe shelter from their predators. It still seems amazing that they managed to survive, despite the scarcity of vegetation. Hour after hour, the convoy of vehicles keeps moving. A spring, with water that's potable for both humans and animals, becomes an unintended rest area. The gas truck has a leaky tank. Apparently, travelers stop here often. There's even a souvenir shop selling mostly local products, stones and bones collected in the area by nomads. Makeshift repairs have soon been completed and the convoy can continue. After a 10-hour journey, they arrive. They have reached the camp in the middle of the Gobi Desert. The only thing they all want to do right now is sleep. Shortly after sunrise, the group is already on its way to a balloon flight over the sand dunes of the Gobi Desert. The pilots check whether the wind direction and strength are favorable. 7.5, 8, 8.6, yeah, that's just rubbish. Yeah. A wind velocity of 15 kilometers an hour with strong gusts. That's too much to take off in a balloon. The crew decides to wait until the wind dies down. A bit later, Ali decides to give it a try. Helpers spread out a cloth to protect against the sand. Even though the gusts aren't that strong anymore. Okay, well, we'll give it a try. I'm not very confident that it will work. But... Okay, good luck. It looks like it's going to work. But the wind soon picks up again. Everything is still going to plan. Once the air is heated and the balloon aloft, Ali will have won. The gusts pull and rip at the balloon's envelope. The big balloon can't be controlled any longer. Phil pulls the rip line, opening the parachute, the top end of the envelope. Hot air escapes and the situation is under control. Sorry. <laughs> nice try. Nice try, yeah. And that was it. Yeah, it's just too guessing. 
Right, that showed you when not to inflate a balloon. It's just too gusty and uh, it wasn't meant to be. The wind isn't the only problem the balloonists have to face. Sand is just as much of a hindrance, especially when it comes to moving on. And they definitely want to move on, out into the desert to a better place to launch their balloons. They have to have at least one more successful flight. Everyone knows what they're supposed to do. It all goes like clockwork. And off they go. The terrain is ideal. And takeoff conditions perfect. Arid steps, as far as the eye can see. All the stress and frustrations of the past three weeks seem to just melt away. For one last time, they can marvel at the sheer endless expanses of Mongolia. On they fly, until sunset and well beyond. Sri Lanka, formerly known as Ceylon. The tropical island is almost as large as Ireland and lies off the southeast coast of India. Coconut palms, rice paddies and electricity poles are all huddled together in a small space. It's tricky finding a suitable place to land a balloon. And quite a challenge for the pilots taking part in the Sri Lanka Balloon Festival. Anil Yayashinga has been organizing this meeting of hot air balloon enthusiasts from around the world since 2003. The Sinhalese airline pilot has made the festival famous around the world. Phil has been participating from the beginning but this is Ali's first time. Palm tree lined coasts, exotic creatures in the air, on land, and in the water. Temples shrouded in mystery. And of course, the exotic panoramas all contribute to an unforgettable experience. To the west, where the sun sinks into the Indian Ocean, lies Colombo, the capital city of Sri Lanka. Nothing remains of the rustic charm of this former fishing village. The Colombo of today is a modern metropolis and a major port of export for the spice trade. 
The festival participants from Europe, the US and Asia gather at Parliament Square in the city centre for the obligatory group photo. It's the start of a two-week ballooning adventure. The adventure itself begins the following morning at Colombo Railway Station. The historical steam locomotive driven train is a favourite with locals and visitors alike. The wood panelled compartments hark back to bygone British colonial days. The train rolls northeastwards at a leisurely pace. The balloon pilots are heading for the centre of the island. The showpiece of the lovingly restored train is the restaurant carriage. And of course, the bar. The classic gin and tonic is generally only drunk after midday, but as the colonial British were wont to say, the sun is definitely over the yard arm somewhere in the Ginger? It's water. The clear water. The gin is to keep away the mosquitoes. We knew why the Brits drank gin tonic. <laughs> The nostalgic ride across the island lasts three hours before the train arrives at the destination. The next stage of the trip is by bus from the railway station to Habarana. Sinhalese folk tradition. Guests arriving at the hotel are welcomed by traditional dancers. And they receive a welcome by an elephant. The animal is sacred in this country. No more gin and tonic today. The balloon pilots have an early start in the morning. Four thirty a.m. No rain, no wind. An ideal start to the first day of flying. Festival organizer Anil hands out the latest weather reports and, most importantly, maps. Fire is the crucial element in hot air ballooning. The burners are in fact huge flamethrowers that aren't easy to handle. The pilots heat up the air inside the balloon. Hot air is lighter than cool air, which creates sufficient lift to carry several passengers, depending on the size of the balloon. Phil and Ali's balloon is ready for takeoff. The Sri Lanka Balloon Festival has no competitions. For the participants, the fun is adding yet another exotic destination to their logbook. Phil has flown in well over a hundred different countries. Ali has yet to catch up. Country number 45, Sri yeah. Lanka in the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Ali's experienced eye tells her that landing isn't going to be easy. She already began the lookout for suitable landing spots shortly after takeoff. Using Anil's maps, Phil and Ali orientate themselves. There are little settlements along the major roads, mostly hidden under palm or cashew nut plantations. The goats try in vain to hide from the huge hissing monsters in the sky. It's always good to talk to animals. And they're not so scared. You can see the cashew nut flowers quite clearly from the balloon. Ali is familiar with the trees from earlier flights. Wenn, wenn die Blüte vorbei ist, mhm. dann wächst dieser Cashewnussapfel ja. und aus diesem Apfel kommt dann die Cashewnuss raus. Shimmering white stupas are Buddhist monuments that can be seen from miles around. In Sri Lanka, they are known as Dagobas and are part of every temple compound, often with holy relics sealed inside them. Buddhism has shaped this country's culture for over 2,000 years. 70% of the country's inhabitants are Buddhists, but Muslims, Christians and especially Hindus live here too. For years, warlike skirmishes with the Hindu Tamils gripped the country, but peace has reigned since 2009. During the early part of the day, the sun heats up the earth, thermal currents are formed, and the winds become unpredictable. I think the critical thing is that we don't want any more right. We want to be at the very worst. If yeah. we overshoot him, we want to be inside that loop of rice. Yeah, sure. The other balloons are also looking for places to land. They are few and far between. The best spots are quickly taken. I only see that, that thing, but there's just no access, isn't it? That would be a nice field, but no tracks to anywhere. Well, the main thing is to find a place to deflate yeah. the balloon. You need yeah, a place yeah. to deflate this thing. That's yeah. the trouble, isn't it? You can't just land What somewhere. about this area ahead? Is that good? Your decision, your P1. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're going to try to land on this big rock because it's nice and clean. Uh, and there's a site where we can hopefully also deflate with a clean balloon. So it would be a good plan, but let's see what it is. Are you Bowen? That's a shot. Are you Bowen? I'm not Are sure. You <laughs> Might have been slopey when we touched down. Yeah, that's ourselves. right, so be okay, careful, I'm folks. We're going to be... go in this grass here, right at the beginning. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, no, we need to stop. Very good. Very good. Helpers from the nearby temple construction site come running. And their help is needed. The balloon is as tall as a four story house. It now has to be carefully folded together so that it can be transported. Ali, watch it. That's good. Yes, we're pulling. Are we clear? Good. Yes. You are very good. Well done. In the afternoon, our experienced balloon pilots turn into excited tourists. There are some 3,000 wild Asian elephants living on Sri Lanka. For a long time, they were regarded as an endangered species. But thanks to numerous conservation projects, their stocks have slowly begun to revive. 
Asian elephants don't grow as large as their African cousins, and they have smaller ears. In the past, they were hunted for their precious ivory. Today, it's generally only for photo opportunities. This bull elephant obviously feels bothered. Not an entirely safe situation, as bull elephants can weigh up to five and a half tons and can flip over a jeep with all its passengers with ease. Luckily, he soon loses interest in the inquisitive visitors. Deep tracks in the rice paddies are clear proof that elephants don't just stick to the diet of leaves and grass. A fully grown pachyderm needs about 150 kilograms of sustenance every day. They can destroy a whole crop and with it an entire livelihood with their foraging excursions. For centuries, farmers here have guarded their fields at night to frighten off the elephants with noise or even weapons. Out of reach of the elephants, they have built little huts on the rocks or in treetops. These elevated sentry posts offer good views and an effective early warning system against possible marauders. But the nights are long. To stay awake, farmers recite long poems called Pelkavi that have been handed down the generations and are today taught in heritage lessons at school. The next flying day starts once again long before sunup. Hot air balloon flying is not for late risers. Setting up for takeoff on the sports grounds near the town of Dambula. Everyone has to lend a hand. Phil and Ali's burner needs around 100 litres of propane gas an hour to keep the balloon aloft. It's a cloudy day today, but the weather balloon indicates that the wind conditions are fair. It's time for takeoff. As the day advances and temperatures rise above 40 degrees centigrade, the balloons lose their lifting capacity. But for now, the difference between the outside temperature and the hot air in the balloon is still large enough to carry the basket's occupants through the air. This is why early morning and late evening are the ideal times for hot air ballooning. It's just past 7 a.m. Children are setting off for school. Anil, the festival organizer, has to keep an eye on the balloons all the time from the ground. He coordinates the various teams that will be collecting the balloons later after they've landed. The market just outside town is both rendezvous and bazaar for the entire region. Everything is on offer here from fruit and vegetables to household utensils and beetle leaves, said to be stimulating as well as good for your health. Anil is in constant contact with the balloons. The wind has dropped. Phil and Ali bob slowly up and down above the main road of Dambula. In the schoolhouse, no one's thinking about lessons anymore. The children rush out into the schoolyard. After all, it isn't every day you have hot air balloons floating by overhead. Hiya, Bovan. Good morning. Ayu Bovan means long life and is the standard greeting in Sri Lanka. Ali prepares to land next to the school as the wind is picking up again.
she'll have to land quickly. The gap between the palm fronds is very narrow, but it's a dry, harvested rice paddy, and who knows when she will find another place like it. Great. <laughs> school attendance is compulsory on Sri Lanka, and so is wearing a school uniform. Both are paid for by the state. The school system is regarded as one of the finest in Asia, and more than 90% of the population here can read and write. So we are getting down from here, we are going to start... On the afternoon agenda, there's a journey backwards in time to medieval Sri Lanka. Polonaruva, the ancient royal city. In the 11th and 12th centuries, it was the capital city of the island kingdom. Grand temples, statues and palaces were erected and still bear witness today to the power and importance of Sinhalese royalty. It was one of the most significant epochs in the history of Sri Lanka. The ruins today are a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage. But you can see lots of uh, beautiful uh, carvings here, the black stone carvings, all handmade. <laughs> The 10 hectare archaeological park attracts hundreds of visitors every day, not only from overseas, but locals as well. But there are still peaceful oases on the grounds. Jakanas live up to their name of lily trotters as they hunt among the lotus blossoms. There are plenty of insects, amphibians and little fish to make it an ideal refuge, despite the tourists. The reclining Buddha statue is one of Sri Lanka's most important artworks, a symbol of Buddhism revered to this day. It attracts many admirers. The ruins are inhabited by tribes of Ceylon bonnet monkeys, a type of macaque, who enjoy nothing more than digging into the offerings left by the devout. A paradisiac life, only rarely threatened by dangerous neighbors, such as this monitor lizard. Macaques live in large family groups and belong to the few primate genera that can swim and even dive. The next day of flying has a built-in adrenaline shot for participants. Two parachutists from the Sinhalese military have been invited by Anil to risk a jump from the basket of a balloon. Together with Phil, he gives the parachute jumpers a precise briefing. For the soldiers, it's a first. They usually jump from helicopters or airplanes. But free falling from a balloon is much more extreme. The balloon moves so slowly, the parachute jumpers feel as if they're jumping off a high tower. Okay. 
Phil has had parachutists jump from his balloon before. They need to be at um, a minimum of 3,000 feet above sea level, so about uh, 850 meters, uh, to make a jump. And, but we must climb higher than that in order to start a descent so that when they jump out, the loss of their weight doesn't upset the stability of the balloon, and the balloon then levels out and then we create another descent before the second parachute jumper goes. When we jumping from an aircraft and a balloon, the main difference is we feel sinking effect. Now we feel very fast we are going down, but with the aircraft speed, we are going down and we are going forward. Then we don't feel that uh, different. I mean, uh, we feel from this, when we jump out from this one, we feel sinking effect. That is the main difference. The balloon of Swiss pilot Adrian Held suddenly looms dangerously close. It's a dicey situation. Phil has to climb in order to avoid a collision. Adrian, we're above you! Now the parachute jumpers can prepare themselves for the jump. Okay, now you can go up to your uh, jump position and um, hang on up here, facing backwards and ready for jump. Good luck. Yes, you can go up. You tell us when you jump. Yeah. Okay, get ready for jump. Don't get much more. Okay, in your own time, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Stand by. Five, four, three, two, one. The parachutist heads for the ground at 180 kilometers per hour in free fall until at last his parachute opens. Meanwhile, his compatriot is ready for his jump. Below is okay, no? No balloon? Yeah. Your colleague is just about yeah. drifting into the launch side. Are you ready? Go! See you at the ground. About 500 meters above the ground, he pulls the cord and his parachute opens. Unlike a balloon pilot, the parachutist can steer directly towards his landing site. lands on a harvested rice paddy. Meanwhile, Phil and Ali float on in their balloon. From the air, the scenery unfolds beneath them a wonderfully fertile land that provides its inhabitants with everything they need. A majority of the population of Sri Lanka lives off the land. Apart from rice, farmers also grow spices, caoutchouc trees and coconut palms. Farmers live in amongst their plantations. Hello, 
rice paddies and coconut plantations characterize the landscape of Sri Lanka. The coconut palm is also known as the tree of life. Its fronds, fruit and wood can all be harvested and used. However fascinating the views, balloon pilots can't afford to lose track of the traffic situation. Do you see them? Phil and Adrian have another close shave. Okay, we're clear. Only half coming. Where are they? Just over there. We can't get far. The rule here is: the lower balloon has right of way because the one up above can see more and can take evasive action. Many of the rice paddies are ready to be harvested. But it's the dry, harvested rice paddies our balloon pilots are looking for. A banana tree brings Adrian to a halt. Ali chooses a field in the vicinity and manages a landing with no braking assistance, although it's a bit bumpy. A balloon in the middle of a rice paddy is grand entertainment around here, and the locals are more than ready to lend a hand. Thank you, that's good. Adrian contacts the organizer, Anil, and gives his landing coordinates. Yes, we're next to Adrian. And I can quickly, we're about... Um, the followers have to know exactly the where they can collect the pilots in the maze of fields and narrow pathways. There is almost blanket mobile phone reception here, which helps. Meanwhile, a flatbed truck is on its way, but it can't negotiate the narrow dirt tracks. It's going to take sheer muscle to carry the heavy baskets to the nearest road intersection. <laughs> the lucky ones managed to hitch a ride. The big truck has enough space for all 14 festival balloons. Dark, looming clouds signal a change in the weather. Storms are unusual in March. The monsoon season starts in early April and lasts until October. There's no question of flying their balloons anymore. The heavy rains drive the festival participants away from the country's interior. They head for the coast on the northeast of the island. 
for a bit of sun, sea and relaxation. The white beaches of Sri Lanka were once a holiday maker's paradise. Until Christmas 2004, the tsunami of the century hit not only Indonesia and Thailand, but destroyed the south and eastern coasts of Sri Lanka completely. Almost 40,000 people lost their lives, buildings and boats were demolished, and the country's infrastructure was totally disrupted. The effects of this natural disaster will be felt for a long time to come. There is still not enough money to rebuild villages and replace boats. The fishermen aren't starving though. Their traditional method of trawl fishing yields rich bounty. Helpers receive a part of the catch and there are always takers for the rest. As soon as the storm front passes, Phil and Ali return inland for another flight. Hi. They're on their own today, as the other festival participants preferred to stay at the coast. But Phil and Ali didn't want to miss a day with such perfect wind and weather conditions. Anil faithfully follows them in the retrieval car. The morning sun shimmers magically across the calm fields below. Rice paddies far and wide. From the air, it seems as if most of the island is covered in them. But the rice produced here only covers domestic needs. Rice is the staple and is eaten at every meal. Countless dams supply the water, essential for rice crops in the paddies. The dams are a great favorite of the water buffaloes. These powerful creatures have for centuries been employed here as beasts of burden. They are strong, yet peaceable. Wallowing in water and mud cools their skin and protects them from irritating insects. To grow a kilogram of rice, you need between 3,000 and 5,000 liters of water. During the monsoon season, rain is plentiful. When the monsoons are over, the 2,000-year-old irrigation system, with its man-made dams and channels, ensures that the rice paddies can be used year-round. The high-yield rice crops can be sown and harvested two to three times a year. The farmers each farm their individual allotment. The work is exhausting and usually only brings in enough to feed their own family. But most Sri Lankans still live off the land. A 
Anil has to hurry up. The balloons are just about to land. And once again, the balloon pilots are looking for a suitable place to land. Harvested, but not yet flooded for the next crop. It's not an easy task, navigating among the multiple hazards of electricity pylons, dams, roads and flooded fields, to find a landing place that's also in the wind direction. Often, they only discover just before touchdown whether their choice was a good one. Ali steers towards a free patch of farmland. And sets the balloon down gently. A textbook landing. Everybody alive? Yes! Yeah. 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 Good team. Uh, Phil to Anil, we're on the ground um, adjacent to a road in a relatively dry patch. All righty, we'll, we'll, we'll backtrack. Right away, Anil sends his helpers off to collect the balloon. As in every Buddhist country, there are numerous stupas on Sri Lanka. They were originally erected as tombs for eminent monks, but soon became a symbol of the teachings of Buddha. A stupa should be circled clockwise, which is said to improve one's own karma. A belief in reincarnation is useful when you're driving a car in Sri Lanka. Hair-raising, overtaking maneuvers on the narrow roads seem almost obligatory. Hooting is pretty mandatory as well, and no one takes offense. The next destination for our balloon pilots is the central highlands of Sri Lanka. It's a three-hour bus ride along a winding mountain road. In 1972, with the declaration of independence from the British Commonwealth, Ceylon was renamed Sri Lanka. However, Ceylon tea is still recognized today as a symbol of quality. Together with India, Kenya and China, Sri Lanka is one of the largest producers of tea in the world. And the area around Nuwara Eliya is a major producing region. Nuwara Eliya lies about 2,000 meters above sea level. And with a temperate 16 degrees centigrade average, the climate is ideal for growing tea. Tea harvesting is women's work. A stick indicates which leaves and buds may be picked. Whatever grows above the level can be harvested. A woman can harvest around 18 kilograms of tea every day, for which she receives payment of about two dollars. <laughs> The tea leaves are taken to a nearby collection point where every sack is carefully weighed and the weight noted. Afterwards, the still green tea leaves are put through a complicated process of fermentation and drying. Nuwara Eliya is known as City of Light. There are many stories explaining why this is. One of them claims that nowhere on earth is light reflected as mysteriously in its dew and raindrops as up here. 
the roar of waterfalls forms a constant background sound. But the beautiful landscape is not the only reason for this journey into the Central Highlands. Nestled among its green hills lies the Grand Hotel of Nuwara Elia. The exterior looks a little like an English country manor. During colonial times, it used to be the residence of the British governor. Phil and Ali have something special in mind. But will the wind cooperate? It's worth a try. This is a prize-winning English garden, but Phil has been given permission to take off in his balloon from here. Getting a 20 meter high balloon inflated and up in the air in such a cramped space takes a lot of helpers. The hotel employees form a human fence to protect the costly herbaceous borders. The fan first blows cold air into the balloon to inflate it. There isn't enough space to inflate the balloon as much as usual. Phil has to switch on the burner so the heated air in the balloon can get it to stand upright quickly. This is the critical moment, as the still semi-inflated balloon can easily catch fire. Petunia has been damaged. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a photograph of you for our, right. our records. Okay. And thank you very much for thank allowing you. us to be here at your thank beautiful you hotel. It's a, it's a very nice uh, thing, you know, I think first time in New Orleans. Fantastic, but not the last, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> You're part of history now. <laughs> Without the weight of the hotel manager, the balloon nearly takes off on its own. Uh, hands on, please, hands on. Right, OK. <laughs> But Phil has no intention of flying off alone. Hands off. That's fine. Let go, please. Hands off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the Grand Hotel. They did it. From the air, it seems even more unbelievable that they could have taken off from such a tiny space. In the 19th century, British colonial officers used to come to Nuwara Aliyah to rest and recuperate. The damp climate and frequent foggy mists must have reminded them of home far away. Many buildings and gardens from back then are still preserved today. It was the era of the powerful tea barons. Ceylon tea became world famous. The wind direction is ideal and blows Phil and Alley to the only good landing site for miles around. Where's the racetrack? That's the racetrack. That is the racetrack, yes. 
Olli, wo seid ihr? Auf der Straße da hier. Ja, wir landen jetzt in der nächsten Tür. After 20 minutes, the flight is over and Phil has fulfilled a long-held dream. Well, this is the flight I planned eight years ago when I was here and thought we've got to do this and now we have. That's... Oh dear, there's a horse. Hang on, there's a horse. Okay, I'm going to be landing on this track. Phil lands safely. Hands on. Hands here they on. are. The team are here. Yay. Good boy, brilliant. Oh, well done. Thanks very much. A successful a conclusion to the 14-day trip. Have fun. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you. Now it's time to return to Colombo. The drive back to the capital takes two and a half hours. Of Sri Lanka's 20 million inhabitants, only 600,000 live in Colombo. Colonial buildings rub shoulders with high rises and stupas. The city is a veritable potpourri of cultures and centuries. What up there? The last place on the balloon pilot's itinerary is fittingly Parliament Square. The festival ends with a night glow, right in the city centre. The balloons light up the night like enormous lanterns. Festival participants are bid farewell with music and dancing. The early mornings, the eternal search for suitable landing sites, all forgotten. What remains are the memories of breathtaking balloon flights over the island, rightly known as the Pearl of the Indian Ocean. Phil and Ali Dunnington are first in line when ballooning tradition meets alpine nostalgia. The Tannheimer Valley in Western Austria hits January for balloonists, the start of their winter season. Phil and Ali come to this valley high up in the Tyrol almost every year. In winter, calm, high-pressure weather conditions prevail. And with the landscape covered in snow, there are hardly any thermals. Ideal conditions for balloonists to practice their sport. On the ground, Thomas Kutzenberger keeps radio contact. As chase crew member, as they're known in balloonists' jargon, He's responsible for retrieving pilot, basket, and envelope after they land. Yeah. 
eye to eye with Alpine peaks. The weather is brilliant, bright sunshine, clear air, and unusually mild temperatures for this time of year. They fly north from the Tannheimer Valley over the Allgäu Alps into the Alpine foothills, crossing the border from Austria to Germany. Phil knows the area. We have a great view of Neuschwanstein there. Look, just coming into the sunshine behind the mountain. And Hohenschwangau, a bit closer to from that. And the Forgensee all frozen ahead of us here. And it's just incredible today. After an hour and a half in the air, the propane gas is running low. Phil starts the descent. Komm, wir fangen jetzt in den nächsten zwei Minuten mit unserem äh, Descent, mit unserem Abstieg an, kommen äh, runter auf äh, Ebene. Wir gucken mal, wo es hingeht, gleich Richtung Seeg. Okay, ich bleib dran. Okay, prima, danke. Ciao. The search for a landing site begins. Tom just has to stay close to them so he doesn't lose sight of the balloon. But he's still got to find the right road to follow. For Phil, however, the wind dictates his direction. This meadow is where balloon and chase vehicle are going to reunite. Phil touches down skillfully between a fence and the edge of the forest, avoiding contact with cowpats. But the area is a little too small to deflate the balloon. The team has to maneuver the balloon by hand out of the perimeter fencing. Phil keeps the 350 kilogram giant in the air with short bursts from the burner. Brilliant, fantastic team. Excellent. The next morning in Tannheim, there still isn't much to indicate that today is the start of the balloon festival. But before it begins, pilots and crews meet for a briefing. Rudolf Hofer organizes this balloon enthusiasts meet every year. So, briefing. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Grüezi. I fang gleich mit dem Wetter an, damit ihr gleich wisst, wie die Situation ist. Ich habe gerade mit Herrn Tilger gesprochen von der Flugwetterwarte Stuttgart. Das Wetter ist halt so, dass wir eine Kaltfront von der Tschechei haben, aber die wird laufend schwächer. Aber die nächste Front nähert sich morgen. Also, das schöne Wetter von gestern haben wir heute nicht mehr. Für morgen erwarten wir also eine Störung bei uns und im Alpenvorland. 
not very good prospects for the next few days, so all the teams want to launch today at least. It gets a little tight on the field with 25 balloons. Only when the first ones take off can the next ones start setting up. Before every launch, the most important thing is the safety check. Finally, Phil and Ali are ready too. The 20 meter high balloon rises to its full height. The festival is like a family gathering for these balloonists. They've all known each other for years. Phil's friend, Richard Gieseling, is piloting the neighboring balloon. Richard, yeah. I'm gonna climb a bit and see if I can get a bit more that way. Okay. Together, the balloons float over the little hamlet of Tunheim with its thousand inhabitants. Even without walkie-talkie contact, Phil and Ali want to get aloft while the weather is still holding and visibility is still good. Over the valley, Phil lets the balloon rotate around its own axis. Three hundred and sixty degree alpine panorama, live and in color. Richard stays close to the ground at first, ascending when Phil descends again. This time the wind doesn't carry them over the mountains. Phil has to find a landing site in the Tunheim Valley. Power lines pose a great danger to hot air balloons. Landing in the nursery wouldn't be ideal either. But if the wind stays the way it is, Phil will be able to park close to the guest house behind the stream. Now they have to start dismantling the balloon quickly. Um, yes, I'm just trying it. Yeah, pull now, pull now. Phil opens the parachute, the lid of the balloon, to let the hot air escape from the top of the envelope. That's good. 
With the help of the crown line, which is connected to the top of the balloon, the envelope is then tipped in the right direction. That's good. Yeah, you're clear. That's good. When the balloon is lying flat, the air escapes slowly. Right. To speed it up a bit, Ali pushes the rest out. <laughs> so that's it. Great. Thank you. At the end, every muscle is called upon to fold up the bulky 150 kilogram envelope. With a well-coordinated team, it takes less than half an hour to dismantle and stow balloon, basket and equipment. They've all earned their supper today. Next day, the forecast weather change has arrived. The Zugspitze is already enveloped in cloud. This is where the German weather service is located. The Eipse cable car traverses the 2,000 meter high difference from the valley station to the top of the mountain in only 10 minutes. At 2,963 meters, the summit is the highest point in Germany. Phil and Ali want to get some first-hand information. The Zugspitze weather station has been collecting meteorological data for over 100 years, around the clock. The station head is Manfred Christen. Hello, Christen. Hi, Christen. I'm with Anning. Hello, Christen. Manfred, we'll get your actual weather here. Yeah, we'll see what we're going to do. Thank you. This was the stand today in the früh um 3 Uhr. You see here, in the früh um 3 Uhr, the front on the Donau gelegen. Und die ist mittlerweile angekommen am Alpen Nordland und es wird zu Schneefällen führen. Es wird auch die nächsten Tage nur Schnee sein, die Temperatur sinkt. Und äh, zum Freitag hin soll es dann ein bisschen auflockern. Da kommt dann das Hochdruckgebiet äh, von Westen rein, wird dann wetterwirksam. Man muss dann noch mit Schauern rechnen, aber doch mit sonnigen Abschnitten zwischendurch. Und äh, die Windsituation, die bleibt. Äh, Nordwestwind in der Höhe mit, äh, mit Böen. Meanwhile, it is snowing in the valleys. It might make it more difficult for the deer to find food. But for winter sports enthusiasts, it's a blessing. Not for the balloonists, though. They have to decide what they're going to do. So, as we can see, that was today, or is still today, as we can see out of the window, that mm. was what the weatherman at the Zugspitze also told us. It's quite a strong northerly wind. And on this weather forecast, it says we're back to winter, which is <laughs> true. We've already experienced that. Well, today's finished anyway, so let's look at tomorrow. And if we want to fly around Neuschweinstein, that's actually the area up here. Yeah. And now we can just see this tiny little gap in the cloud cover. So very little wind from the north west. west. Yeah. So that's the same it as might the work for a hop then. We could um, at least give it a try. Yeah, um, it's very short though, by the looks of it. It's very short, mm. yes. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether that's gonna work.
Despite all the concerns, next morning the sun is shining around Neuschwanstein Castle. The wind direction seems to be good too. Minus 10 degrees. It is bitterly cold. Ali wants to launch before the bad weather front moves in. It's hardly worth setting up the big balloon for such a short flight. Today is an ideal time to use Ali's mini balloon. Richard Gieselink and his wife Helen help them to set up. The so-called hopper has no basket. The pilot sits in the open, right next to the gas cylinder. He, or she, may not weigh more than 60 kilograms though, so that rules fill out. From the parking lot, the balloon heads over Schwangau, towards Lake Falken. Okay. Right, all aboard. We follow you. Okay, good. Off we go. Phil is driving the retrieval vehicle. As an Englishman, driving on the right takes some getting used to. Ali, Phil, uh, we're at the main road uh, looking for guidance. Yeah, well, there's no guidance at the moment because I'm still debating whether I uh, want to dare to cross the lake or not, so stand by. Constant radio contact is essential now. Unfortunately, there's a farm and there's power lines and then there's a lake. Oh, I do a rapid descent already now. Ali has three kilometres of half-frozen Lake Fog in front of her. Phil, Ali, we have your visual. We're about uh, 700 metres to the northeast. I just try and land in the last spot before the lake, but I might not be able to because of the horses and the farm and trees and power lines. Understood. Well, we're uh, moving down towards the lake. Uh, we haven't got your visual at the moment, but we'll advise. Ali is probably going to have to risk the lake crossing. Um, it's about the same distance now from where I take off, and I've got at least uh, 4.4 knots. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, obviously, with the front coming in, uh, the thing is going to be good, I think. Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, let's just keep fingers crossed this wind stays where it is and doesn't change to a southerly or something crap. I mean, I hope to coast in somewhere along that road with a fresh behind. Understood. Uh, we'll come. OK, she wants us to go across the other side of the lake. OK, okay. Yeah. so where we're going um, is, let's just have a look on the bonnet. The, the retrieval team tries to get its bearings. So we are here. Oh, so she's, she's coasting out and she's going across here, yeah. 340. So what we need to do is to go back in towards Wilson. Wilson and go up to the Fest Spiel House, which yeah. is up here somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Ali is right in the middle of the frozen lake when the wind drops. We're 293 now, but only two knots, but I think that's the best I get. So just keep it across. I make it across without running out of gas. That's my main worry. Understood. How far across are you now? Well, I would say not even half. Understood. We're on our way round. We're in Fussen now. Ali is trapped above the lake. We have your visual. You seem to be making reasonable speed now. OK, keep fingers crossed. I mean, uh, the tank is not taking up, so I still should have at least 20 minutes duration. 
Yeah, if you think you're going to have to ditch, let us know and we'll probably have to call the retons people because you're not going to be in that water for more than a few seconds. Yeah, it's fine for now. Just keep stepping. Understood. We'll be with you. Ali goes down. With her last gas reserves, she's going to chance a risky manoeuvre on thin ice. Lucky you only weigh 55 kilos. <laughs> In their haste, the team ends up on the wrong section of the lakeshore. More where the lift place is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Richard, yeah. if you go back to where we were before, yeah. and that lift place, she's just coming in there. In fact, I'll come with you. Ali inches cautiously across the ice. She reaches the safety of the shore even before her retrieval team gets there. Oh my God! Look at that wonderful crazy. track across the lake. <laughs> I've never seen that before. No, I've never seen that before. <laughs> Snow walking in a balloon on a frozen <laughs> lake is probably really pretty unique. <laughs> but I mean, I'm so glad I'm back on firm terra. Uh, yeah. One hand, Mama, give me, give me a little hand. Was sieht man schon wie? Guck mal hier, so dünn ist das Eis. Das ist echt ein Zentimeter. Also da hätte es nicht drauf gehen können. Aber mit einem Hexen Baby. Oh, war das gerade noch die richtige Schicht, so dass ich mich drüber schieben ja. könnte, ha? After this adventure, they both head off to the International Balloon Festival in Chateau d'Eau. Every year this exclusive Swiss Alpine resort becomes the rendezvous for aviation enthusiasts from around the world. A hundred balloons from 15 countries. The creme de la creme of the international ballooning fraternity happily rubbing shoulders in Chateau d'Eau. The very special charm of the Alpine village and the excellent wind conditions in the valley of Chateau d'Eau make the festival enormously popular. Ali takes advantage of the calm weather to do some training. Although it's the wind alone that determines the course of the flight, it actually changes direction depending on the altitude. The pilots use this to steer the balloon through the skies. The ideal place to have is actually 090, 090, which would be directly high. We have 114 degrees with five knots, that means we are fahren im Augenblick äh, leicht zurück, ja, Richtung Südosten. Ne? So ja. im Tal runter ging es sich dann. Sind wir gut aufs Kreuz? Sind wir gut aufs Kreuz? Ja, ja so wir haben noch 200 Meter. Below them, the wind seems to be dropping. Der andere steht komplett unten im Tal. Ja. 
können wir einfach mal gucken, auf welcher Höhe wir dann die beste ja. Richtung haben. Ist immer schön, wenn man Ballon nichts hat, wenn man noch andere wagemutige Ballonfahrer vor sich hat, die uns dann schön den Wind zeigen können. But balloonists don't just have to catch the right winds. Staying aloft and managing controlled ascents and descents takes practice. You have to learn to allow for the balloon's delayed reaction to your input from the burner. To get a feel for it, crew member Oliver Redler is going to keep the balloon floating as close as possible to the ground. Letting the balloon descend slowly, not burning too much or too little. That's the art. It was a super landing, right? It was 19, so it was a perfect landing. Spitze. It was not like this stop over the balloon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was perfect. Very good, okay. For balloonists, Chateau Deux has a historical significance. In 1999, this was the starting point for the first non-stop balloon circumnavigation around the globe. Bertrand Picard and Brian Jones were the first to succeed. There's a monument to these aviation pioneers in the village center. And this is where Phil and Brian Jones meet, two distinguished aviators. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing to think, really, isn't it, that it's nearly 12 years since all of this I happened. Know, and I know, and it's sad, actually, because this is just 12 years old, and this used to be a nice little brass balloon. I see we've been demoted to a cheap screw. Some, somebody's stolen it. Yes. <laughs> so so you've got that one up on me. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of water, yeah. Okay. yeah but, um, I mean, is the kind of thing... Is, of course, you always find people discussing whether now that that's been done, there isn't really anything else because you can't fly to the moon by balloon. Mm. So apart from, you know, Ali doing it solo on yeah. her own, the first <laughs> woman around the world, there isn't really a lot else can be done, is there? Does it matter? Really? I mean, there's, I mean, the, the sport of ballooning is all about this is sort of flying like in the valley here yeah. this morning. It was gorgeous, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, uh, and people kind of say, well, you know, you've flown around the world. How do you feel about flying? Mm for half an hour in the valley here, and you say, well, just the same as I did before when I went the world. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I love fun. doing. That's what yeah. they call it, isn't yeah. it? I yeah. always love that. Yeah. It just goes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Enthusiasm and passion are shared by festival participants in equal measure. Today, two parachutists are planning a risky jump out of a basket. Only experienced pilots will take parachutists on board. The sudden weight loss when they jump can cause the balloon to destabilize. And if the parachute doesn't open properly, it could be dangerous for the parachutists too. A few anxious moments, and then the aerial acrobats demonstrate their astonishing skill. Meanwhile, Ali is preparing for her own appearance. In the afternoon, they're joined by the next generation. After all, you can't start soon enough. There are balloons in all shapes and sizes. Between the comic book heroes and special shapes, Ali takes off in her hopper.
A special shape can cost over a hundred thousand euro. An expensive hobby for real balloon fanciers such as Nicolas Lefranc. On est juste un amateur, on fait ça dans les loisirs depuis 20 ans. Et on a un travail à côté, on fait ça que les week-ends pour nous faire plaisir. Each special shape is unique and generally demonstrates the individual preferences of its owner. Pourquoi l'Obélix Parce que je rêvais de faire un ballon en forme. Mais il fallait que ça soit un peu plus qu'un ballon en forme. Un ballon qui porte un message. Alors euh, il fallait chercher quelque chose qui soit gauloise, qui soit quelque chose qui représente un peu la France, mais toujours dans l'humour bien entendu. Alors il fallait un personnage, et lorsqu'on a défini euh, ces, ces paramètres-là, un personnage, un ballon en forme, je crois que l'évidence c'était Obélix. Il n'y avait pas d'autre vis évidence. At nearly 50 meters high, the Flying Scotsman is the largest bagpipe player in the world. But even though there's only hot air under its kilt, it has to stay anchored to the ground, as it's too old to fly. Everyone shows off their best points. The pilots try to use the light wind currents so that they stay in the valley as long as possible, close to the audience. But not everyone succeeds in finding the perfect wind direction. The Wild West cowboys seem to be irresistibly drawn to the mountains. The Gallic hero positions himself confidently right above the village. Whereas the bug seems to be heading for the trees, quite appropriate really. Helping hands rescue it from the branches and bring it back to the landing site. This special airship is another of the festival's major attractions. Hello. Hello. It's a thermal airship. Like the hot air balloons, its buoyancy is created by hot air. But it has an engine for propulsion and can fly against the wind. In contrast to balloons, such a thermal airship or hot air airship can be steered and therefore determines its own direction and landing place. After a couple of turns above the spectators, they all head back to the launch site. Next morning, the competition start. There are target flights, distance competitions, and the pursuit race known as Hare and Hounds. The teams secure their launch sites even before the obligatory briefing. Good morning, everybody. Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. After the greeting, 
Festival director Michel Reichenbach hands over to the weather experts. Magnifique journée, comme d'habitude, wonderful day again. For today, the wind, uh, there is no problem. It's not exceeding uh, critical uh, values. We will have uh, a maximum of five knots and also the freezing temperatures uh, for today. Have nice flights and see you tomorrow. Coordination is important in the jostling throng. A safe takeoff in between all the other balloons is by no means easy. The control center keeps an eye on everything. Today the balloons are being directed by Céline Duracell. And from Chateau de Information to all the balloons, the target at Limuna is open. As the aviation safety expert, she manages everything monitors radio transmissions, and registers which balloon is taking off and when. The so-called launch masters ensure that everything runs smoothly at the launch sites. They are an essential safety factor, as from their baskets, the pilots can't see anything at all above them. The launch master has to indicate to them whether the airspace is free overhead. Communicating above the noise of droning fans and hissing burners is made simpler with whistles and hand signals. Halt mal die Barung unten, dann drehen wir die Hände hoch. Das Zeichen, jetzt musst du equilibre sein, also im Gleichgewicht mit der Luft. Machen wir dieses Zeichen und im Moment, wenn wir die Arme strecken, ist, kann er gehen. Wir können aber auch sagen, stopp, sofort, sofort aufhören zu heizen und den Parachut ziehen, das Ventil aufmachen oben oder ganz abstellen, sofort abstellen mit dem, mit dem Brenner. One by one, the balloons get permission to take off. But not all of them are in the air yet, by any means. Several pilots have to open the parachute the lid at the top of the envelope and let the hot air out. Launch master Klaus Friedrich has given the order that they have to wait. Moment haben wir sehr wenig Wind, eigentlich null Wind, mit dem Effekt, dass wir derzeit drei verschiedene Höhen haben, in denen die Ballone fahren, so dass die Piloten sehr aufpassen müssen, wenn sie steigen oder fallen, dass sie nicht ineinander fahren. Aber da die Konditionen insgesamt sehr ruhig sind, Kein Problem, solange die Piloten voilà, derzeit aufpassen. Nur wir sind unten auf dem Feld derzeit etwas blockiert, weil wir einfach zu viele Ballone über uns haben. At last, Phil and Ali are allowed to take off. When finally a light wind picks up, Phil and Ali decide to take part in today's target flight competition. Come really low again now. Look, wow, she's such a good The aim is to throw a marker as close as possible to the target cross marked on the ground. The direction looks fine. I'll try a throw. Keep it straight so I can see it. It 
was too early again, shit. Ah. Pretty close. We're going to be competition ballooning duck from now on then. Eh? I've heard I missed it by 10 metres and then the, the thing just flew back right on the cross. That was the ground wind, which I tell you was quite fast and it just banged it on the spot. Of course, after Ali's terrific performance, she gets to take over the role of pilot. Ali has to ascend to catch the right wind current. Gourmets will know the Gruyere Valley for the eponymous Swiss cheese. Balloonists, however, appreciate it especially for its steady wind conditions. But today the wind seems to have decided not to blow down the valley. Ali decides to climb a little and possibly get out of the valley while heading in the direction she wants to go. Soon she's just over 9,000 feet. It takes a long time to descend to a landing site from such a high altitude. Phil and Ali have to fly with more than usual foresight in order not to miss the point at which to start the descent. Ali discusses matters with her ground crew. Yeah, we make now the decision if we are going to go very low and maybe the wind will come back again. Or if we are going to go down to the Gruyere Tal. In the moment we are a little bit better in the direction of the Berge. Ali decides to ascend. The moment of truth for vertigo sufferers. They're more than 10,400 feet above sea level. Right, 077 at two, so that's going back now. But the wind is a capricious thing. It turns and slackens off, right over the steep mountain peaks of all places. The view is fantastic. But there's no landing site they can reach, just craggy rocks. At last, the wind picks up again and carries them away from the mountains. Now they have to descend quickly. 15 minutes to come down. 15 minutes is a long time for a descent. Enough time for the winds to change and blow the balloon in another awkward position. Okay, let's start to come down. Yeah. So you agree? Yeah, we're making it a, what's it called? This then, halten Abstieg. 
ähm, dass wir so schnell wie möglich runterkommen. When Ali only burns very little, the air in the balloon cools down and the balloon sinks faster and faster. She catches it shortly before she's about to land. What you can see is that the balloon is automatically rotated because the speed of the speed is too high. Wow, it feels a bit safer now here, I would say. Wow, oh, gosh, it still feels like a big relief to come down here and not over these rocks. Now, the nice. now they only have to find a landing site. A bit tricky with the power lines. I think I go beyond now, so going down again on the other side. Well, but just be careful. Ali has to land here, as the terrain ahead is dense forest and rocks. The chase crew wouldn't be able to reach her by car. Hold, hold. Be a, bit, be a bump on landing. Hold on. I suggest you deflate. Deflate the bloody yeah, thing. Deflate, okay. Can you just help now? Okay. Yeah. Ich merke es. Oh. Mama mia. Wow, it's so Now just get the hot air out of the envelope and they've done it. Okay. I got it. All right. Oh. Ah. Oh. Wow. It's the combination of adrenaline-driven drama and bird's-eye panorama that makes these balloon flights so extraordinarily special. At night, the balloons give it all they've got. The traditional night glow signals the end of the festival in Chateau Deux. Fire and ice, idyll and adventure. That's what hot air ballooning in the Alps is all about. The Gran Sabana, isolated wilderness in southern Venezuela. For hot air ballooning, this is virgin territory. At 1,000 meters above sea level, this vast plateau is almost the size of Spain. And this is where Phil and Ellie Dunnington meet up with German film director Werner Herzog. Their goal is the Tepuis, rising like islands from the Gran Sabana. These flat top mountains are shrouded in legend, each one a world unto itself. From Caracas, the balloonists traveled across the entire country. After three hours flight and 10 hours drive, they reach Santa Elena de Huaren in the southeast of Venezuela. The little town on the Brazilian border is not quite a hundred years old. With only 30,000 inhabitants, it is still the largest settlement within a 200 kilometer radius. 
the central square is dedicated to Simon Bolivar. His charismatic leadership of the South American independence movement in the early 19th century confirmed his status as national hero ever since. With the help of tour guide Eric Bushbell, the balloonists get to know the special features of the town. Santa Elena came to life as a gold mining town. The Gran Sabana's gold and gemstone reserves have lured prospectors from around the world since the early gold rush days. Over time, the town also became a meeting point for tourists keen to explore South America. There's a vendor selling freshly squeezed orange juice on almost every street corner. Welcome refreshment for Phil and Ali's ballooning team. Before the balloon takes off, Phil reconnoitres the area by plane. With him is Ivan Atar organizer of adventure tours of all kinds and based in Santa Elena. They're looking for suitable takeoff and landing sites for the balloon. There are plenty of places to land in the almost deserted Gran Sabana, but apart from the road networks close to the sparsely scattered settlements, or gold diggers camps, there are very few other roads that would allow the balloon and its crew to be retrieved. It is a real problem. Phil's goal is the Tipuis. The bizarre flat-topped mountains are the symbol of the Gran Sabana. Some Tipuis rise up to a thousand meters from the plane. Planning a hot air balloon expedition here seems risky. Where to take off and land when the terrain consists of virgin forest and steep rock faces? The only option is to have the balloon and its passengers taken by helicopter to a suitable place for takeoff, and if necessary, have them airlifted back out again. But the only helicopter in the area big enough to transport a balloon has just been downed in an accident. On the way back, Phil and Ivan agree they have to play safe to begin with and stay in the savannah. Because we don't have a helicopter, I think we can't risk flying over the mountain and landing somewhere that is away from a road. Yeah. And we just might run out of fuel and duration and we could safely land, but without a helicopter, we can't get back. So yeah, that's a I problem. think that's the safe option. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm agree. So where are we looking at next? Uh, well, we, we flew today here. Mm -hmm. we Ivan knows the area well and suggests a takeoff location that will allow for a safe flight. At least if we've got plenty of savanna, we can just go to one side yes, or the other, yes, depending on the wind. Yes, yeah. yes. And well, as you know, everything is possible, but nothing is easy. Yeah. <laughs> At last, they're ready to start. The balloon will be escorted by Ivan's brother, Juan Carlos Atal, flying his paramotor. Juan Carlos and Ivan are local aviation experts. Both of them have been flying paramotors for 20 years. Today, the balloonists are keen to familiarize themselves with the Gran Sabana and its features.
Juan Carlos Paramotor is an added safety factor. He can follow the balloon even in inaccessible areas. Off, Far away in the distance, the Tipwees beckon silently. But first, the wind and weather conditions need plotting very carefully. Phil takes off to check. The wind direction seems to be less favorable higher up, so he stays close to the ground. The balloon can only drift with the wind, but the paramotor can be steered almost like a small aircraft. The pace is leisurely. The wind direction good. The balloon's first flight of discovery in Venezuela takes it over the Lagunas Encantadas, the enchanted lakes. The savanna is a bare region, most of it not really suitable as grazing land. The grass is too coarse. The palm tree, however, is seen here as being the tree of life. Fruit, leaves or wood, every part of it can be used. The wind may be gentle, but it's still strong enough to make the balloon bounce about on landing. Kangaroo flight. <laughs> <laughs> As long as the wind doesn't blow on the balloon's envelope too hard, Phil keeps the balloon inflated, indicating his position. At first, the ground crew can't see him, as he's hidden behind the hills. The followers in their 4x4 only find the balloon when the paramotor shows them where to go. Now, Phil opens the parachute, the lid of the balloon, to let the hot air out. The balloon's maiden flight in Venezuela was successful. The symbol of Santa Elena de Juarez also known in the vernacular as the unfinished Madonna. It has been awaiting completion for years. Long queues at the filling stations. This is partly due to the amazingly low price of petrol as it's subsidized by the state. A full tank, nearly 80 liters, costs around $1. In neighboring Brazil, it is a hundred times more expensive. Fuel might be cheap, but it isn't always available. That also applies to the propane gas used here for cooking and heating. Even the containers are a scarce commodity. The balloon's 15 gas cylinders had to be bought in Caracas and transported 3,000 kilometers to Santa Elena. Now. 
It takes about an hour to fill the four bottles with propane gas for the following day's flight. Time for a caparina. One cocktail later, the bottles are full and can be set up for the following day. The remaining gas cylinders are locked up carefully for the night. Next morning, the team welcomes German film director Werner Herzog. Und Ellie, vielen Dank für die Einladung, hier dabei sein zu können. <laughs> right. Das sieht zwar nach einem Familienausflug aus, aber ich weiß, ihr habt was ganz Großes vor. Super. Mein Bruder, meine Frau. Wir freuen uns dabei, ja. riesig, mit euch in Venezuela zu sein. So, hoffen wir ja. auf eine gute, schöne ja. Fahrt gemeinsam. Okay, ja. So, I'll give you a quick but important safety briefing. As soon as the balloon is upright, please be close to the basket, ready to climb in. Climbing in happens with these footsteps here. That's gonna be your compartment um, on the other side where the tanks are. Very important now the landing position, which again is very simple. It's like a skiing exercise. So you bend your knees, mm -hmm. feet flat on the ground, okay? But you face backwards. So if the balloon travels yeah. this way, you turn around facing back like the stewardess is on an aircraft and you will only hold in inside. You'll just kind of be here, have your shoulders level with the basket, yeah? So you're not sitting, you're not standing, and you just hold on any side, things are like that. And you stay in here until I say it's okay to get out. Stay in there. Good, okay, that's okay. pretty much all, any questions? Good, okay, so we'll get started, great. Werner Herzog had already visited the twin tipwees of Roraima and Kukenan eight years earlier. Now he plans another excursion to the Table Mountains. The film director knows the Gran Sabana, but he's never flown in a hot air balloon. Right, so hands on. Juhu! Okay. 20 nach 7. Du bist in der Luft. Guck mal, wie schnell das hochgeht, ha? Ohne groß was zu machen, ja. So, wir sind jetzt auf 3000 Fuß, 1000 Meter. Ja, aber das ist Bodenhöhe, ne? Not forgetting the accompanying paramotor, of course. In pleasant contrast to the little paramotor, the balloon mostly glides silently through the air. Das Fahren im Ballon ist ja eine völlig andere 
Sehweise auf die Welt. Absolut. Ja. Ganz sanft alles. Ja. Anders als im Hubschrauber oder Definitiv. im Flugzeug. Ja. Das hat mich auch von meiner ersten Fahrt an total fasziniert. Ja. Und es ist halt und wir wissen nie, wo wir hingehen richtig. werden. Ja. Das, ist jetzt ja. das ist alles das immer offen. Totale Abenteuer. Jede Fahrt ist anders. Man weiß nie, was passiert. Mhm. Ich gebe es kurz einen Brenner. Da kommt der, ist das jetzt Kuckenen oder Roraima? Ähm, Hier drüben, schau. Ja, 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 das ist, glaube ich, Roraima. Ja, 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 das ist der Roraima. Ja. 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 Super. Ja, ich weiß, ihr habt was Großes vor, dort hinten, wo der Berg ist. Absolut. Aber das ja. wird schwierig, ich weiß das. Ich war ja schon mal auf dem Roraima und kurz auch äh, auf dem Kuckenen. Und äh, wir werden das mal besser vorher testen. Ja, ja die Windverhältnisse gehen. und natürlich der Dschungel, mit dem die Tipuis umgeben sind, sind nicht gerade die leichtesten Bedingungen ja, fürs Ballonfahren. Ja. ja, wenn ihr da Richtung Guyana reinfliegt, da kann euch niemand mehr rausholen. Nee. Da gibt es keine Flussverbindungen, Richtig. das sind Katarakte, ja. Ja. Wasserfälle und Dschungel ohne jede Straße. Mhm. Das geht mhm. hunderte von Kilometern ja. und da kann euch keiner mehr rausholen. Yeah, correct. Uh, we have Kukenan and Roraima beautifully in the side, so I think I might start just a little bit more here and then come down and see what I get. And still the plan is to land somewhere near the main road, so if you can just keep your toes following us. Understood. We're just going back to the track and then we'll be making our way back towards the main road. Back to the main road. Unser Ziel ist, ihr seht diesen Feldweg da hinten. Das ist alles okay. Und zum Landen wäre die Straße gut, weil hier kommt ja kein Mensch her, richtig. Ali shows her skill. She lets the balloon float just above the surface of the water. This technique, known as contour fly, requires a delicate touch. The balance between sinking and rising has to be exactly right. Burn too much and the balloon rises. Burn too little and the basket sinks into the lake. Retrieval would then be very difficult. The balloonists have got closer to the tipwees today, but the weather is poor and Ali has to land. the landing position. I try to land maybe here on this track if we can. Okay. Let's see. Pass a message. Pass a message. Pass a message. Yeah, um, we're on the main road now. We're uh, about one kilometer up uh, west of Eagle View. Hold on. It's oh, yeah. very wet here. Shit. Yeah, it's very wet here. Ja, yeah, very wet. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Thanks. Yeah. The grass is okay. wet from the last rains. It's February, which is actually supposed to be the dry season in the Gran Sabana. But this year, the precipitation has been unusually high. Yeah. Phil, just drive with the best car. Uh, the track looks motorable about 20 meters from us. Where we are standing now is pretty wet, but a good car, I think, can still do it. Not ideal conditions, either for ballooning or for mountaineering. But both teams intend to stick to their plans. Come in and stay in there. Why don't you stay for a while until we change tanks so you can all stay in there, okay? It's actually better for stability. Hey, the on family! <laughs> Oh, well yeah. now. <laughs> Time for a little sustenance. The teams stop at a churrascaria. These typically Brazilian steak restaurants 
are not exactly ideal for vegetarians. Here, it's all about meat, meat, and more meat. Werner Herzog and the balloon team tuck in with gusto. Soon their ways will part for a while as the director is drawn to the mountains. The Tipuis, shrouded as they often are in dense cloud. Werner Herzog has been waiting for days to be able to get up Kukenan. As the helicopter stationed in Santa Elena had crashed, a helicopter had to be sent in from the north. And then bad weather prevented them from taking off. But now at last, they're ready. The expedition begins. The flight takes just half an hour, but the helicopter can only take three passengers at a time, so it has to make three flights to get the director, crew, and all their gear up to the mountain, 50 kilometers away. There are 115 tipuis dotted around the Gran Sabana, relics of a prehistoric sandstone plateau. Over the millennia, erosion has worn away the sandstone, leaving behind flat-topped table mountains, such as Roraima and Kukenan. Cut off, from the surrounding savanna by its insurmountable scarp slopes. A whole world has evolved in isolation on their summit plateaus, much of it undiscovered right up to the present day. The Lost World is what Sir Arthur Conan Doyle titled his adventure story about the Tipuis and the animals he imagined living atop them, inspiration for films such as King Kong and Jurassic Park. There are no dinosaurs, but the inaccessibility of the plateaus has certainly given rise to speculation about what does live up here. The helicopter has finally transported the entire expedition team to the mountain. They are welcomed by their Indian mountain guides, who climbed the adventurous route to the top. The team is now on its own, unreachable, and cut off from the rest of the world. Kukinan's rocky desert will be their home for the next few days. This will be their base as they explore the bizarre landscape of the plateau. Rocky overhangs offer at least a little shelter from the changeable weather. Welcome to Hotel Kukinan. In the local Indian vernacular, the Tipuis are known as the Houses of the Gods. There is another name for Kukinan. The Indians call it Matawi, the House of the Dead. The mountain is regarded as being ominous. Years ago, a 13-year-old boy disappeared without a trace up here. A search party of 20 men spent three weeks looking for him in the rock fissures and ravines, but the mountain never gave him back. Since then, Kukinan has been generally avoided.
grueling expeditions are Werner Herzog's specialty. For one of his films, Fitzcarraldo, he even had an entire ship transported through the Brazilian jungle. During his brief visit eight years ago, Werner Herzog was struck by Kukinon's primeval landscape. Today, he wants to capture on film some of the unusual images and impressions he still recalls. No, I mean, you schwenkst rüber und rotierst die Kamera. Wenn du am Wasserfall herunterschaust, kann ich so drehen. dann kannst du so drehen. Ah, ja. Schau doch mal, ob du The director has very specific ideas. At his bidding, water even flows upwards. So weit wie du kannst. Ja. So dass am Schluss sozusagen die Kamera nach, nach, nach oben geht. Ja. Ich versuch's jetzt mal. Ja. Within minutes, the weather has changed. Now Kukenan shows its true colors. The team finally gives up and heads back to camp. As often happens, the mountains shroud themselves in cloud for an indefinite period. Thousands of meters below on the Gran Sabana, the weather is absolutely fine. Chidi Kayen a village in the shadow of another Tipwi. Our ballooning adventurers are going to try their luck here. To get closer to the mountain, they first have to travel through the virgin forest, and there are plenty of obstacles. You have a, a Swiss knife. A Swiss army knife isn't enough, though. The balloon crew has to wait until help arrives wielding bigger tools. Nowadays, you'll find power saws in every jungle village. All clear, and they carry on towards the mountain. The next day, the balloonists are on the road before sunup. Okay. 
Weather and takeoff conditions are usually good this early in the morning, but not today. It's going to be a very difficult inflation this morning. I don't know whether we'll be able to manage it or not. Um, but obviously we want it to be safe. And so the important thing is that everybody knows beforehand what they're supposed to be doing. Despite treacherous wind conditions, they manage the inflation. But the cloud front over the Chiricayente Pui is advancing rapidly. A storm is imminent. Phil and Ali have to land quickly. Okay, yeah, unfortunately we're drifting a lot towards the left. We've got much space, so well, I don't want to get to this. Uh, we're coming down in a minute because otherwise we're going to have space yeah. until we land uh, near the um, forest to the entrance of the village. The balloonists are looking for a landing site close to the village, but the wind keeps blowing them away. They have to land before the next patch of forest, or they risk crash landing. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and get... Yeah, yeah, I know. Made it. Now, get out now and go and keep it off the tree, please. That's it, good, well done, brilliant. Oh, God, you don't need too many actions like that in a day, I can tell you. Wow, 10 minutes of very exciting flight. But the Tepuis are still beyond reach of the balloonists. Meanwhile, atop Kukenan, Werner Herzog's film crew actually wanted to be back down on the savannah a long time ago. But for days now, the weather has prevented the helicopter from landing. At least there's full board and lodging. And running water. Mist and rain alter the perception of things, making rock and stone formations appear like a landscape full of mythical creatures and grotesque shapes.
anyone who gets left behind can quickly become disorientated in the rocky labyrinth. After a few tense moments, the director reappears. He chose a different route through the treacherous terrain. around the corner in a high ledge, safe. The overriding element on Kukinan is water. Fog and rain provide an inexhaustible supply. The plant world has adapted well to the moist conditions. Mosses and lichens absorb the water like sponges. Grasses and shrubs take root in the tiniest cracks in the rocks, defying wind and weather. In these lonely islands, creation has taken its own course, giving rise to flora and fauna that are unique to these plateaus. Carnivorous plants and orchids flourish particularly well in the nutrient-poor sandstone and have developed in an amazing profusion of varieties. For millennia, evolution and erosion have been at work here in isolated seclusion, together creating a world so strange that it seems almost alien. The dense cloud causes huge volumes of water to be precipitated on the plateau. Swamps and tarn lakes overflow regularly, swelling little rivulets and turning them into streams and rivers. Until, finally, as torrential waterfalls, they hurl themselves off the edge of the tipweed. In free fall for over 600 meters, the Kukinan waterfall is claimed to be the second highest on Earth. The foot of the Tipwees is mostly covered in dense virgin forest. It grows along the banks of the rivers well into the Grand Savannah. And in the middle of the jungle is another natural wonder, the Quebrada de Jaspe, an entire riverbed composed of the semi-precious stone Jasper. The stone's red color comes from mineral oxides. Jasper is usually only found underground, but here it has been unearthed by the river and lends it a glamorous brilliance. Meanwhile, Werner Herzog's team has managed to get off the mountain. But it was a close shave. Kukenan and Roraima are almost always covered in cloud. The balloonists have still not reached their goal yet. Today is the last chance for Phil and Ali 
to fly at least close to the Tepuis with Werner Herzog. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Venezuela. We see each other in Brazil. <laughs> He'll be leaving Venezuela tomorrow. We're heading straight for Brazil. Straight for Brazil, great. Yes, yes. Rio, here we come. <laughs> and look at that, just look at the tepui sticking out of the yeah. cloud there. Our aim should really be to try and cross the Tepui if we can at some stage. Yes, but you know, last week we spent up there and there's no chance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We went up there cowardly. We flew up a helicopter. <laughs> I mean, it's way too difficult to climb uh -huh. it. Uh, yeah. And with camera gear, absolutely impossible. It needs real mm. mountaineering. And it is really, really bad. So if you want to lose your life and uh. balloon, which is probably more valuable. Yes. You have to give it a try. Ah. With that, it was clear that flying over the Tepuis would for now at least remain a dream. <laughs> Phil stays in touch with Ali by walkie-talkie as the terrain is tricky. A rescue operation would take days, even if the paramotor pilots were able to put a precise fix on the balloon's location. Along the rivers, there's a lot of smuggling of gasoline. Really? It's, well, there's gold uh -huh. and all sorts of wild stuff going on there, precious mm -hmm. gems, but uh, the real deal is gasoline. They smuggle it in, in cars because here in Venezuela, they sell gasoline uh, for, let's say, a huge tank full of uh, gasoline for less than a dollar or mm -hmm. so. And they transport it to Brazil or along the rivers into Guyana and they make a fortune. Wow. Maybe but as we're going in that direction, we should have yes. filled our tanks with gasoline. <laughs> Ali, Phil. A message. Yeah, there's a track right below me now and I think I'm going to have a go for that because I don't see one further on. Okay, Werner, we're going to be landing yeah. in just a moment, so if you're ready yes, for your I'll landing position. Wow, look at the tepui behind yes, us now. Yes. That is magnificent. That's where we should be. Yes, we should, we should. But you will lose everything. Yeah, you we just must... can't do it. At least we've There's seen no, it. No chance, no chance, no chance. It was as soft as it can get. Yeah, that was perfect. And we're at the end of a track, you see, yes. so that's what we need. So, short but sweet, huh? Yes, but look at how beautiful it's it up is. there. You see, we needed that kind of weather. There was rain and storm. I mean, real ferocious, ferocious. And very demanding, I lost all my skin here in the face. Mm. Yeah, and now the weather clears and yeah. we can see it at last. There's nothing yeah. uh, getting as close to science fiction than that here. It looks like an alien world. Yeah, amazing. Like outer nothing. space, yeah. yeah. You have nothing like this on this planet, ever, ever, anywhere. I've seen a lot, but this, this is unbelievable up here. It's time to say goodbye to Werner Herzog and the Tepui ballooning project. The convoy heads back to Santa Elena. Time for a break and to pick up a few souvenirs. Many of the locals live off the tourist industry. In the little cultural museum, tour guide Eric Bushbell explains how the Bemon Indians made their everyday items and how they were used. Blowpipes are usually children's toys. But what Eric relates has a very adult history. Here we have the Brautfinger. That is when the Pimoren a ceremony make, 
und die verloben sich. Am Ende dieser Zeremonie kommt dann der Mann, der nimmt dann seine ausgewählt und sagt, ich bitte um deinen Finger, nicht um die Hand, sondern nur den Finger. Und wenn man das hier zusammendrückt, dann weitet sich das, dann kann man das hier wieder mhm. und dann nehme ich den und ziehe ich in meine Hütte hinein. They have to have one last flight. They plan to spend the night in the open. They won't be doing any ballooning in this rain, though. Three o'clock tea, five o'clock gin tonics, six o'clock cacarinha, seven o'clock wine. <laughs> but the alternative program is still on the cards. In the shelter of an abandoned Indian settlement, the adventurers put up their tents. The next morning heralds the last flight over the Gran Sabana. Okay, bye bye guys. Juan Carlos is there again as their airborne escort. Ali climbs up high, quite risky, as clouds begin to gather below her balloon. have no radar to give them advance warning of any danger. And enveloped by cloud, they can neither see nor be seen. Nature puts on a particularly spectacular show with the interplay of light and clouds. The balloon is in the middle of a rainbow. And Phil and Ali float over the vast plains of Venezuela, heading for new adventures.